And a welcome to FNI Master Series Forum, The Digital Age. My name is Becky Chernick, and I'm going to be your host for the next two days. I am super excited about it. But before we open up, I wanted to thank our wonderful sponsors, Ken Hill with 700 Credit. Thank you for all your support. And it's been a pleasure working with you and hope we can do this again. Now, Carrie Wise, Autofy. What an amazing and very special lady Carrie is. We appreciate your time. I know how busy that you are, and you're certainly an icon in our industry. Paul Nicholas with Otomoto will be here with us tomorrow, and he's got a very special story about his background that I think that you'll really like. Automoto will be revolutionizing how lending is going to get done, offering more opportunities for independent and franchise dealers alike. So they certainly have made it possible to bring this event to you at no charge. Here we go. And I would also like to thank our keynote speakers, Patty Covington and Eric Johnson with Hudson and Cook and Brian Kramer. Brian Kramer is that forward thinking GM with Germain Toyota and Lincoln, and he's going to be kicking us off tomorrow. So fantastic. You don't want to miss this discussion at all. Talks about moving your team forward from traditional to completely digital workflow. And you will also hear from Dory Musi. And she is this Beth and I manager with Jermaine Toyota. And she discusses her experience from traditional to completely digital. It is quite the story. And you got to know it wasn't easy, right? Auto dealers will want to check this one out. What's stopping you from taking the steps to leveraging your technology from online to in dealership experience? Stop the madness. Stop all these excuses. Create this exceptional customer experience. Cut back on CIT, chargebacks, and all these unnecessary disruptions. I've also invited exceptional thought and process leaders from automotive retail, allied industry folks to join forces 
to discuss these best practices and strategies, innovative solutions that will certainly help dealers to sustain market share, to continue to thrive in this changing times. But what you will find out in many cases, change doesn't necessarily require heavy lifting or reinventing the wheel. You will need to know how to pivot your thinking to reach your highest potential. And you'll also find out that leveraging technology doesn't take away from the human factor. And it will help you to be more efficient. It will build credibility and it will maximize those profits. It's all about that repeat business. So I would like to share my background since you'll be spending a little time with me to give you an idea of how I think things through, thoughts regarding F&I and how I see this digital age playing out in dealerships throughout the USA and what's and why it's so critical that we're paying close attention to what's taking place in your own backyards. No doubt, there's going to be plenty of auto dealers who will hesitate and continue to sit on these sidelines. But as they do, keep in mind, CarMax, Carvana, Sonic, Penske, Asbury, and our keynote speaker, Jermaine Auto Group, featured speakers, Wester Automotive Group, Benton Baker, Bet Benton Baker Auto Group, the Nelio Company, Foundation Auto Colorado. Well, they certainly aren't doing that. They are planning. They're creating unique ways to be even more competitive. Whatever it takes to win in that market share is their motto. And let's face it, CarMax is crushing it. CarMax is doing what it takes to win more customers and keep them coming back for more. They offer every option to engage with that customer. Auto dealers are making more profits than ever before, but that doesn't mean you take your eye off the ball. We need to stay in this game and beat that competitor at their own game. It isn't time to lay down the sword. Customers want to buy a vehicle at a brick and mortar store. They just don't want to spend all day doing it. We rely on this repeat and recurring customers. It's not about that micro moment of a menu presentation. So as Steve Apizello points out, it will be about the reoccurring customer, that digital life cycle, which doesn't mean you're not doing business face to face. You're just doing business smarter. So I started my career in car business over 30 years ago. I was hired by Al Packer, Lincoln and Mercury in Baltimore, Maryland. At a time when a women weren't supposed to be selling cars. And I proved that I certainly had the car gene in my blood. So later on, I get promoted to F&I. You know, I died and thought I died and went to heaven. This was awesome. I was made for F&I. So I worked my way up the ladder to F&I, to director for large automotive groups in the Washington, D.C. area. So it meant I had this ego about a mile long. And I thought, man, I got this. I know this. Until I was hired by Jim Moran and Associates. So they have this uncanny way of showing you that you may not know as much as you think you know. So we all do have a tendency. Once we hit this pinnacle success in our careers, we just put these blindfolders on. It's hard to get your attention. It's hard to learn new ideas and strategies. And so Dave Anderson, he points out, success can be our worst enemy. So one of the best lessons working at JMA a was that I realized that if I wanted to grow and thrive, I needed to keep my eyes, my ears open to new ideas. So that was an incredible time in my career. And when you're a specialist, which I got to share with you, JMA, and I was traveling with this suitcase in my hand and staying in hotels and you're working bell to bell and nothing is glorious about it at all, but it's all about the learning curve. You're either filling in in finance or you're kicking off stores. You must create a significant impact that dictates your worthiness to perform at a higher level, to be considered for a promotion. And I got to tell you, nothing easy about that. We were in dealerships throughout the country, and I quickly realized that dealers who have some sort of a process will always fare better than a dealer without one. And that was a really important lesson. A process will either make you or break you. So I was promoted to the Auto Nation Mega Store division. And if you don't know who Wayne Heisinger is, he is probably the most revolutionary, forward-thinking visionary of his time. He 
He founded Blockbuster, Waste Management, he owned the Dolphins, and he turned this car business on its heels. Everything that I was taught to do in F9, who made me super successful, I was a superstar in this, but in this role, I'm doing the complete opposite. This is where menu selling started. Our team revolutionized how F and I was going to get done. We took this nation by storm and we were meeting the customer at a kiosk in the middle of this showroom. This was unheard of. You got to know, not taking a customer into the box to close them down, the ball and chain mentality, taking two hours to close them down on a service contract. You know the days. Instead, we're meeting the customer at a kiosk in this massive middle of the showroom. We're presenting this menu, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. The customers understood all the terms of the sale. They understood their base payment. They understood the interest rate, their trade-in amounts, their malfinance. Nothing was hidden. Each product was offered at 100% of the time to all the customers. And again, anyone trying to kind of fluff that payment, pack the payment. If they got caught, they were immediately discharged. AutoNation megastores had zero tolerance for unethical business practices. I'm not even kidding you. And we were met, you got to know, with tons of resistance and the naysayers, one right after the other. You can't be upfront and still be profitable. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, we didn't listen to that. It wasn't easy. It was tough. But we moved forward, we proved them wrong, and our team never looked back. So from the mega stores to the new car stores, and they would tell us that you can't do full disclosure menu selling in, the, in these stores, Becky, maybe in the mega stores, but not in our stores. Our customers are different. But that didn't happen. We were successful. We cut down on that f &I bottleneck. We reduced CIT and chargebacks. We increased customer satisfaction. We made it easy for the customer to buy a car and we had a lot of fun doing it. Seeing is believing and we proved them all wrong. The performance increase in customers just loved the experience. It was a win-win. Auto dealers realized menu selling wasn't a fad, but here we are 25 years later. Instead of meeting the customer at a kiosk in the middle of the showroom, we're now meeting customers online at their home or office. We're giving the customer options. We're making it easier on the customer to buy a car. It's that Amazon or Apple approach, keeping it simple while still improving PVR and maximizing those profits. I found in my company, Cherney Consulting, on those same best practices and principles. And I realized early that early engagement with our customers made a whole lot of sense. Meet the customer on their terms. At the salesperson's desk or online at their office at home is critical to building that credibility and rapport. It doesn't matter if the customer is buying a vehicle at the dealership or remotely. So I've assisted dealers and their managers in understanding the concept of being upfront. You are maximizing those profits from the time the customer touches down on the dealership website to working with a sales associate to desking. But let me ask you a question. Is your F9 manager on the desk pitching and looking for better ways to get that deal approved or even a better loan approval? The desk is the new hub. It's the heartbeat of the dealership. So it's critical that we bridge the gap between the departments. It's all about this holistic approach. So I train on f and fundamentals to finalizing this transaction with either an f and manager, a hybrid, or even a single point sales associate. If you're not interviewing every one of those customers, whether it be remote or in the dealership, you're leaving profits on the table. It's a talent that seems unfortunately, to be eroding today. And by the way, I'm not out for replacing the F&I manager. I want to provide the best tools, innovative solutions and strategies to help sell more cars, reduce this liability, reduce fraud, and maximize profits. It can be done. It's being done now. But my intention by the end of this event will be to provide you with really good information from exceptional thought and process leaders to provide insight, strategies, and techniques you may want to consider implementing at your dealership. Look, every dealer is different. There is no same to all cookie cutter approaches. So 25 years later, 
since we've kicked off this menu selling in the AutoNation Megastore. Today, we have some of the best technology on the planet, such as DocuPad, Stone Eagle, or another digital menu provider and DR platforms. But ask yourself, is it being utilized to its fullest potential? Are you really completely satisfied with the results that you're getting? Is your customer completely satisfied? So I'll share a quote from a friend and featured speaker today is going to be Joe Caruso. Just because you know how to email or text doesn't necessarily mean you're any good at it or you'll get a response that you're looking for. So meaning my meaning, just because your team may be using this digital menu doesn't mean they're doing it effectively. They're efficient. They're offering 100% of the products to 100% of the customer. They're consistent in that markup. And are they compliant? So speaking of which, compliance. Hudson & Co. keynote speaker, if you haven't been reading the news on this social media, there are countless lawsuits from millions of dollars popping up all over the country, which is affecting dealers, ma and pop shops to all these largest public trading companies. So it's not time to get lazy and put that sheet over your head with compliance. Make sure you pull in those reins. Accountability is going to be king. This event couldn't be a better timing to invite Patty Covington and Eric Johnson with Hudson and Cook to go over all the updates with us. I promise, I don't think you'll be disappointed at all. So it will be a pleasure to introduce Patty Covington and Eric Johnson with Hudson and Cook. But before we do that, let me go over some of their giveaways because it's, they're really cool. If you don't receive an email from them, email me back at Becky at churningconsulting.com. But here is your giveaways. A couple of things to keep in mind during that panel discussion this morning, you want to type in hashtag Patty, hashtag Eric with that name and email. And the first 25 will receive the revised free F&I legal desk book. This this desk book is really cool. Registered attendees will also receive a 99 annual uh, subscription to the spot delivery, which was regularly priced at $349. 700 Ken, Ken Hill will talk about this soft pull and why, why dealers are making more profits on those deals. And also offering a free day 60 day free soft pull. So you got to get involved in that hashtag 700 credit. And I got to tell you, you're going to love it. And if in the event you miss out, don't get the email for 700 credit, email me at Becky at Before I forget, one more time, let's go over those speaker, speaker agenda this morning. Of course, we have auto five, Carrie Wise. She's going to talk about meeting the customers on their terms, online, offline. And we certainly appreciate Audify sponsor. Thank you again. Uh, Point Predictive with Frank McKenna. He's going to dive right into what is synthetic fraud and how to reduce fraud at the dealership and process can either make you a break or that's something that I talked about. Steve Apicella, it's not the micro moment of the menu. It is about that pre-sale during and after. And then my dear friend, Bob Farlow, who I is my mentor. He's retired, semi-retired, uh, previous more, uh, McGeorge Toyota for many years, market president at AutoNation and GM Coons Management Company. It's all straight up talk. Where are dealers headed with this technology? Is digital retailing you know, a, a buzzword? And the single point sales associate, is this really happening? Are dealers really thinking about doing this? And then Josh Latisis, managing partner, Foundation Auto Colorado, discusses how deep will that dealers go into this Evanite technology and more. Very important thing I want to make sure you realize, look for the new link for tomorrow's event. It will be sent to you in an email tonight and tomorrow. Okay, so here we are. Give me a few seconds to go ahead, kick off Patty Covington and Eric Johnson. I know you're going to appreciate this panel. So 
good morning, everyone. And I got to say, it is a pleasure to go ahead and kick off our first session today um, on the F&I Master Series Forum with Patty Covington and Eric Johnson with the Hudson and Cook Law Firm. So pleasure again to have you here with us. And boy, let me tell you, you've got quite a bit to go ahead and cover for everyone. And so here again, what I would like for you to do is if you would just share your background and your credentials with everyone. And I know you have a bunch to get into. So I understand you're going to be talking through safeguards, FTC uh, guide, uh, guidance, online customer reviews, vehicle protection plans, as well as red flags and of course, remote delivery. So with that, um, again, Patty and Eric, thank you again. And then I'll be coming coming back, um, you know, in about 30 minutes or so, and, and we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So how about it? Thank you again, guys. Thank you, thank you. Becky. You are delightful. We really appreciate being invited to your event. Um, we're, so we're really honored to be a part of it. Thank you very much. And we I think this is a fantastic forum for dealers and you know expect and hope that dealers get a lot out of this and continue coming every year hopefully in person next year so thank you for inviting us and we're happy to be here good morning everyone um of course i have to kick it off unfortunately with um our standard lawyer disclaimer which is our remarks during this um presentation are for educational purposes only that means, of course, it is not, there are not legal advice and the webinar does not establish a, an attorney client relationship. The views that Eric and I talk about today are not of, they're our own views and they're not of the firm. So please, um, when you're looking at, you and you're considering the issues that we talk about today and you're considering them and deciding how to move forward, do so in conversation and in discussion with your um, knowledgeable attorney. And I will um, really highlight knowledgeable attorney because these are some very technical things and you want to make sure you have an attorney that is um, well informed on these issues. So Becky invited us to tell a, you know, a little bit about ourselves. So we'll do that. Um, I, I'm Patty Covington. My partner, Eric um, Johnson, is, is um, beside me, at least on the, little, on the, on the camera. And so I am in our um, Hudson Cooks Richmond office. I've been with Hudson Cooks since 2005. And prior to 2005, I was with CarMax. I was with them for seven or eight years, and it was a great ride. I was a, you know, a, had been practicing five years when I joined them. And it was a fantastic experience because it was the, really the, towards the beginning of um, CarMax being and when they started taking off. So I was deputy general general counsel there when I left. So I've been a dealer and I've been a captive finance company and now I'm outside and I have um, been, you know, I obviously counsel dealers as well as finance companies and have a, and as well as really all kinds of providers in the industry from um, vehicle protection product providers to DMS providers to really anybody that's got is a stakeholder in the industry. Um, I have, and I'm, I know Eric is also represented. So we are, we cover sort of all of the areas. Eric, you want to tell a little bit about yourself? Yeah, you bet. And it, it, good to, to be here with you again. Usually we're sitting side by side, so it's a little, we are. A little different, but at least we are visually side by side. Um, I'm Eric Johnson. I'm a partner in our Oklahoma City office and uh, been with uh, the firm since 2013. Before then, um, I was a partner at another uh, law firm here in Oklahoma City practicing consumer finance law. Um, I was also in-house with a um, uh, financial services company down in Austin for a number of years. So I've, I've got that in-house in background as well and uh, come from a car dealer family. Um, our uh, family had, uh, uh, has a dealership from my hometown and I've worked there probably since I was you know, five years old and can help out in the parts department or help, help on the showroom floor all the way through college. And I think in many respects, uh, practicing law is sometimes easier than I think that being a car dealer is in, in many respects. So, um, but that's really what drove me into wanting to get into uh, dealer law and auto finance law is my background and, and you know, family's background is uh, from being car dealers for franchise dealerships. So I'm glad, glad to be here and, and uh, we'll, we'll have some, hopefully some um, things that we can offer you for, 
for spot delivery and, and for uh, F&I legal despot, but we'll go into that in, in, here in just a bit. So yep. Thanks for mentioning that because that's something that we, you know, we always try to be a practical solution to our, you know, clients and those that we work with. And so um, part of your dealerships. So I'm going to kick us off with talking about not a fun rule, but something you really need to be paying attention to, which is the safeguards rule. So um, this should not be new to anyone. And if it is, you know, call me immediately <laughs> after this program. Um, this, um, the safeguards rule has been undergoing um, some evolution and some changes. And it started a while back ago. So it's been in the queue since 2016. And this was when it first came up for the FTC to review. You may recall the F safeguards rule is an FTC um, is a rule. Uh, the FTC has a practice that they take all of their rules and their guides and they review them on a regular rotating basis, usually 10 years. And so the safeguards rule came up for its, um, at its review. And the FTC looked at it, they asked for comments on it, they went through a number of iterations of comments, and then back in the fall of 2021, it published its final rule. The final rule was effective at the beginning of this year, and that was really with respect to some of the provisions, mostly um, definitional, not so much the technical requirements. The technical requirements become effective December 9 of this year. And um, this is something to be looking at. It was a really a overhaul, I would say, of the safeguards rule. It, um, it, it changed, I think the most significant thing is that it changed the entire approach to safeguarding consumer information. It took it from being a very flexible standard to a very technical requirements that you have to have in place, which really put in place rigid standards that all information security programs are going to be evaluated, assessed, and, and I'll say judged by. So really important. Um, the prior rule had this flexible approach where it really considered and allowed for the dealership size, their systems, the type of systems and the amount of number of systems they had, the types of information that it maintained and the, and, and where it and the scope of the information they maintained. But that's not the case anymore. So now they have specific criteria that dealers have to, have to have in place in connection with their um, data security uh, programs. Some of them are which like this technical, like encryption, encryption of data that's at rest as well as data that is in transit, dual um, um, authentication. So that's more multi-factor authentication. And that's something not new to us that we see it right now with other services that we have where you know you have you get a code and then you have to put in the code and so that that type of requirement is going to be in place for accessing consumer information um, there's also a requirement to have a written security incident program and so you know it, it would it's always a good practice to have it but it's never been a, a requirement so you have to have something in writing um, so there are lots of others and I'll talk about a few others as we go along but Eric and I, and we do a lot, and something we didn't mention at the front end, and I'll mention it now, is we do a lot of things together. We, there is a um, compliance, um, uh, compliance uh, professional training program that Eric and I um, put together um, for an, an association, and it's a, it's a four-module thing. But anyway, the point is, is we, we do this a lot together, and we like to be really practical in what we provide as advice is not, you know, just kind of viewing out the law, but telling you some of the things that you should be doing to comply. And so, you know, what's my best advice here? And it's get started now, N-O-W in all caps, because the requirements are burdensome and they're very technical and they're very um, intense, very, a big, huge change. So, you know, it's a big lift. And so, you know, what's an example of that? Well, let's just talk about your service providers. You've had service providers and vendors that you work with for a very long time. And now you actually have to do more than just kind of an initial due diligence of your service providers. In connection with hiring them, you've got to have certain elements in place. You need to essentially understand whether or not they can comply with the safeguards rule. The new rule requires that you take re reasonable steps to select your service providers to retain them and ensure that they maintain, like maintain, not just have in the beginning, safeguards for customer information. And so why is that important? Well, the FTC has now identified what are cru crucial and key elements of a safeguards program. 
And that's in our rule. So, you know, really everything that you're required to do, you've got to look at your service providers to see if they can do the same thing. Because while it's not specified in the rule that you do that, it's kind of baked in because it's reasonable to have, you know, the FTC has interpreted that having these things are reasonable. So you ought to have make sure that the folks that are doing business with you are also doing that. And that also applies to your affiliates. You also and this wasn't in the old rule, but it, you know, it's kind of a practical you should, you have to periodically assess your, um, your service providers. And that requires that you're ongoing monitoring of them and that you're looking at those contracts and that you're reviewing the relationship to make sure that they're performing as they should be performing. Another big change that's a little bit of a tweak of, and that's actually a big tweak of what they had before, are risk assessments. Originally, when you implemented your um, uh, your safeguards, your information security program, you had to do a, a risk assessment, and which is pretty logical. We need to understand what our risks are. We need to assess the, you know, and do a rating of the risks and then look at to see if we have controls in place for it. But now the requirement is that your risk assessment be written and it be periodic. So it's not a one and done. You have to have um, done it like now when you're updating your information security program, and then you have to do it periodically, and I would say on an annual basis. And you're going to need, uh, the, the rule requires that you take certain elements into consideration when you're doing that risk assessment. And so I'm not going to go into them now because we don't have time. We have a lot of issues we want to talk about. But you need to look at those, look them up. You need to talk to your, um, your, your knowledgeable counsel on that to make sure that you're considering all of those relevant issues. Because as I mentioned, you have to have documentation. And so it's going to reflect whether or not you did it the right way or you did it the wrong way. So the other thing that um, the FTC has said, this is so important. We're going to require that you're qualified you know, person that's in charge of it, report to your board or that governing body on an annual basis. So every year, that person who's in charge, and I'll talk a little bit about a qualified individual, has to report to the board um, about the program itself. And so what do they have to report? Well, they have to report on the overall status of the program, um, how the dealership is complying, whether there have been issues or not, and any material matters that have come up like, for instance, if you're doing another risk assessment or you're making changes to it or there's been, you know, there's been some information security breach, anything that's material to it the, has to be discussed in that written report. So let's talk about that qualified individual. So it was under the old rule that's still in place that will be changed in December that you could have one or more persons that were in charge of it. And it could be anybody really in the organization. But now it has to be a qualified person. That means it's got to be somebody that's got experience with um, information security, as well as training and ongoing training on information security. And anybody, and this is, you know, another element of the requirement, is that anybody that's within that team also has to be trained and has to be qualified as well. So that's a big change that dealers should be looking at. There are some provisions that allow for having an outside person, an outside like a consulting group or an IT security group, but you need to make sure that they are qualified and you still have to have somebody internally that's qualified. That doesn't eliminate that, that requirement. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention that I think is going to be kind of an eye-opener for dealers is that you must dispose of consumer information within two years after your last use of it. And that's a pretty big change. And it's kind of a data integrity, data minimization issue that they're trying to do. If you don't have the data, it's not going to be subject to um, a security breach or some unauthorized use. And so um, when I say your last use of it, it's not any use of it like you just go use it for something else. It's your last use in connection with providing a product or a service to that consumer, to who it relates, to which that data relates. So um, there, it, are, there are lots of technical things that can be tripped up on, and I encourage you to talk to your, your knowledgeable attorney about it because you've got to be compliant by um, December 9th. So enough about you know that. Eric, I'm going to Kick it off back to you. You can tell them about some of the benefit, you know, some of the nice little um, treats we have for them. And then you're going to talk to us about something else the FTC is focused on. That's right. That's right. Well, well let's get into the benefit first, um, or at least the, one of our first giveaways. So we're offering 25 um, of the F&I Legal Desk books. Um, in order to, we're going to give away to the first 25 that include their name and their email address in the chat. We've, we've 
we need your email so we can reach back out to you. But the first 25 uh, persons that put their name and email address in the chat will receive the ninth edition of the FNI Legal Desk Book. There we go. This is the eighth, but we just came out with the ninth. Um, uh, Patty and I are both uh, chapter authors in the book, but it's um, it, it goes through um, all of the different uh, federal laws in kind of a Q&A type format, real, uh, real easy to read, hopefully easy to understand. Um, that's our first giveaway. Again, first 25 that put their name and email address in the chat. And at the end, um, at the very end of our, our talk today, I'll talk about our, our uh, giveaway for spot delivery, which is a different publication, but I'll save that one till the end. Um, so let me let me talk about a, a recent development at the FTC uh, regarding posting online customer reviews. Um, I, I, I do think that this it's a new settlement that the FTC um, had issued in, um, or released in January of this year. Um, I, I think every dealer that has a website, or I would say probably every dealer that has customer reviews, like I'll see a lot of dealers that will have customer reviews on say Twitter or other social media sites. Um, I think you really should read this somewhat. And this is the FTC's first case where they challenged a company's failure to post negative reviews um, and the FTC thought that the failure to post those negative reviews was a deceptive practice under their UDAP authority. And you might be surprised to learn that the FTC expects you to give equal exposure to both um, positive and negative reviews on your website. Um, this proposed settlement was with a company called Fashion Nova. It's, it was a or is a fast fashion company that sells clothing online. Now, what caught the FTC's attention was that on each product page, when you go in and you look at a particular product on their website, it allowed a consumer to propose a review um, and rate that product on a, on a scale of what, say one to five. It's not that unusual, right? You see that all over the place. However, in this case, the FTC alleged that the company filtered out those reviews that had a rating of less than four, which created a misleading impression of how satisfied a customer was with that particular product. And the FTC alleged that this failure to, to post those negative reviews did constitute an unfair or deceptive act or practice because those reviews um, uh, stated or implied that reflected the, the, that these reviews reflected the views of all consumers when in fact they actually at least allegedly suppressed those negative reviews by not posting those on the website. Um, big penalty um, to Fashion Nova. They agreed to pay 4.2 million in relief, and that settlement was just approved yesterday uh, by the commission. They also agreed to stop making express or implied misrepresentations about their products or endorsements. Um, if, if you're a dealer, you might be surprised to learn that if you allow or encourage your customers to submit the reviews, the FTC under this new standard, this new requirement, they expect you to post even negative reviews on your website. That's a big, big change. From their perspective, the terms of that settlement are simply what they think is necessary to give the public an accurate understanding of a product, um, a product's pros and, and cons, as opposed to kind of a, you know, a rosary sense of what a consumer is, is satisfied with a product or, in, in our case, with a dealership. Um, along with this settlement, they also released a new companion business education piece on posting online reviews that you really should should uh, go to their website and download and take a look at. Uh, in that piece, they did offer some more guidance uh, for staying on their right side. Um, some of these tips include, um, again, not soliciting reviews only from customers that are likely to tell positive stories, uh, not incentivizing customers to submit positive reviews, uh, disclosing any incentives offered in connection with the review process, and again, not discouraging those negative reviews. Now, if you moderate um, reviews, the FTC has a few suggestions for you. Um, one, that you have a reasonable process in place to screen out fake or a deceptive review. Um, not editing reviews to alter a review's uh, message. And to treat, again, treat those positive and the negative reviews equally, good and bad alike. With respect to review publication, they also advise that um, you publish all the genuine reviews without excluding those negative reviews. Um, you disclose any compensation or other connection between the company and the reviewer so that 
a, someone reviewing this can decide whether that compensation uh, would impact their use of the, of, of the review. Um, the messaging on properly posting online reviews also offers guidance for companies that maybe you're not doing the reviews yourself, but you're working with a, a service provider, another vendor that can help you with those and then post those either to your website or other social media accounts. Well, they warn companies, including dealers, that you can be held responsible for what these service providers are doing on your behalf. So you really need to understand how the vendors are generating the results that they uh, are offering. Again, you're not required to solicit customer reviews or post reviews on your website, but if you do, under this new settlement proposal or, or approved settlement now, they're now saying that they expect dealers that publish those reviews to do so in a way that gives the public a well-rounded perspective of a customer's experiences. So not only the positive, but also the negative as well. Big, big change there. Um, all right, Patty, let me turn it back over to you for uh, what the latest is on red flags. Yes, red flags. Thanks so much. Um, so the red flags is kind of like the other part of safeguards. And why? Because the FTC is, I mean, they've always had an interest in um, identity theft and preventing identity theft. And so right now, the FTC is really expressing a lot of interest in the red flags rule because they see that as the other part of the puzzle with respect to um, identity theft. So let me just refresh your recollection on red flags. That requires dealerships to have, to develop and to implement an identity theft prevention program. Like I said, identity theft has always been a priority for the FTC. It's for years been one of the number one, either number one, two, or three complaints that they receive from um, consumers, and it, it's just, you know, if you've ever been a victim of identity theft or fraud, it's, it's not good. And so um, safeguarding information is like that prevention mechanism for it. So we want to prevent consumer information from getting out to bad guys where it's stolen. So, you know, putting in those measures in place to prevent unauthorized use and unauthorized access is one part. But the other part is, um, at the point of the transaction. Let's prevent the bad guys, if they have the uh, consumer information, from using it in a way that is going to harm the consumers. And so that's where the red flags rule comes into play. It's really preventing them from succeeding during the transaction from using it in a way that um, commits or fraud or identity theft. So um, it applies to covered accounts, and I'm not going to get into that because it's the technical definition, but dealers have covered accounts when, in, particular, in particular as relates to credit. Um, and it applies at not only the initial stage, but it applies if you're like, for instance, a buy here, pay here dealer, that you have that account and you're collecting and you're servicing on it. It applies during the account, as well as um, the requirement that if you do in fact see red flags, you identify um, fraud or identity theft, that you do some work to mitigate the negative impacts, the negative effects that will affect the consumer um, that is affected by that identity theft. So this is something that, hap that uh, you know, applies on the initial transaction all the way through to the end. And so it's, it's not something that, if you will, you're just like kind of one and done type of thing. So why am I talking about this? Well, back in 2020, and this, it was a virtual, much like today, a virtual um, conference I attended. The, there was a FTC representative there. He at the time was the chairperson of the, um, um, or the head, if you will, of the Consumer Protection Division. And he said it. He said, you know, we're very interested in identity theft. We're very interested in this red flags rule because we see it as part of the puzzle that needs to get, you know, attention needs to. And we don't think um, industry folks are complying with it. You know, they, we think that it's kind of one of these things where they put a program and they put it on the shelf and nobody's really paying attention to it. Um, and so we want to call attention to it. So we are looking actively for a case to bring against um, industry um, persons to make sure that we make, you know, make examples and draw attention to it. And unfortunately, that's kind of how it happens. And so they have been looking for a case Back last year in 2021, they did actually find one. It was a second or third type of issue. It was a vivid case that happened. It was a pretty big settlement, but it involved other issues like permissible purpose. But red flags rule and violation of the red flags rule was one component of it. 
So I expect the FTC at the FTC to continue to explore and hunt, if you will, hunt down um, another um, uh, company to be that case study, to be that poster child for red flags compliance. And why am I telling dealers this? Well, because y'all are prime ta targets. I hate telling you this. And the reason it is, is not only that, you know, like attorneys generals and FTC like to focus on dealers, but dealers are subject to the FTC's, not only their enforcement authority, but also to its rulemaking authority. They have this special rulemaking authority that's known as APA, Administrative Procedures Act. They don't have that with respect to other industries. So they have a lot of control and a lot of authority with, with, with respect to dealers, and they can do more. So they are definitely more focused on dealers than other um, industries. So um, one thing to note that under the, uh, um, the identity theft, or under the red flags rule and your identity theft prevention program, you are required to continue, continually update it. So if you haven't taken a look at it, please look at it now and get it updated now. And why do I say that? Because not only is there this focus, the FTC is further evidence of like their attention to this. Um, in December of last year of 2021, they published a statement on regulatory priorities. And in that statement, they said that they are reviewing the um, red flags rule and they may do some rulemaking there. And I tell you this because that's exactly how the safeguards rule began in 2016. The FTC started its review of the red flags rule back in 2018. And I honestly, I see that this is going to be the same path with safeguards because they see those as complementary. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if it undergoes uh, an overhaul and enforcement. So I think they're looking and they're going to you know, find some parties in this regard. Eric, I think it's back to you, and you're going to tell us a little bit about vehicle protection products. Yeah, thanks, Betty. So, I mean, what can I say about VPPs? They, they've been the subject of and, and the focus of federal and state regulator uh, authority. And I, I, I would say probably most consumer advocates and probably, if they're being honest, I'd say a lot of the government um, enforcement attorneys uh, hate these products. I have I, heard and I, I you know, they think that they're overpriced, which leads them to suspect that dealers, you know, must be deceiving consumers about these products. Otherwise, no consumer would, would, would buy them, right? So the problem is that kind of thinking can really put a big target on a dealership's, uh, on a dealership that fails to take care in how they market and, and how they sell these VPPs. Now, when you think of how a regulator generally attacks a dealership for these products, uh, I would say that it probably falls into one of three claims. The, the first, they claim that the VPP or the dealership claimed that the VPP was required. In other words, that the product was not optional. Um, they claim that the dealership misrepresented the cost of the VPP, or they may claim that the dealers, dealership mi misrepresented the value of the VPP. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to um, handle each of these attacks. Um, so let's talk about the first one. The, the, the first is the requirement or the, the claim that the VPP was required. Now, I'd say this is probably the easiest concern to avoid, but ironically, it's the one that um, is probably most you know, lobbied or charged against the dealership. Um, the NADA and other trade groups have published an extremely helpful guide that includes a model dealership uh, policy on VPPs. It's called Voluntary Protection Products, a Model Dealership Policy. We recommend that you get it and adopt it ASAP, of course, with your knowledgeable counsel's help. Um, and if, if you're looking for it, you can find it on NADA's uh, website. Um, I will say that this model VPP is helpful not only for this first claim about whether the, the product is required, but it also, I think, is helpful for the other, other claims as well. Um, the, the model, uh, VPP policy also can, contains a template of, a, of a, a sign that you can post in your F&I office that, that the products you sell are optional and that they are not required to purchase or lease a vehicle or to obtain warranty coverage or financing. So again, it's another good way of showing the customer, look, they're, they're optional, they're not required. On the second front, the second attack of the, the cost of the VPP. I would say, and I think menu pricing is probably the best way to inform a customer of the cost of these optional products. 
And, and the key feature of a, of a menu should be that you're showing the customer the price of and the monthly payment for um, each VP if they purchase it separately, or if maybe relevant, maybe you've bundled these products. So you're showing them as a part of a bundle as well. Um, and make sure that you quote every customer the same price for each VPP, or else you could face a claim of um, illegal discrimination as well. Um, on the value claim, you know, the, the, the dealership misrepresented the value of the VPP. Well, if you sell it, then generally you're going to be responsible for the claims, or at least brought in to, to show that you uh, are, are somehow responsible for those claims. Even if you're giving the customer a brochure or some other marketing piece that maybe you didn't prepare, but was prepared by the vendor. Um, here are some questions I think you can ask both yourself as well as the vendor about the product. Um, what is the claim benefit of this product? And are we sure that that is true? Um, are there important exclusions uh, from the benefits that are maybe not a part of the marketing material or the brochure, or maybe not in the contract with the customer? Maybe they're not in, um, in the brochure or the material. Um, are the benefits reasonable under the terms of this particular deal? Um, that'd be a great attack for this is unfair or deceptive uh, to the consumer. Um, one other tip, ask for substantiation of all the claims that are made by the product vendor. Um, because again, um, you could be on the hook for these claims that can't be substantiated in advance. A couple of other compliance tips to think about. Um, be sure that the customer knows how to claim, um, how to file a claim and whether a deductible applies. Be sure the customer knows whether the VPP can, can be canceled and if so, how they would go about canceling it. Um, as well as um, taking a look at whether you need to uh, take the initiative to cancel VPP if you know it's no, it's no longer beneficial to the customer. That's something really you need to probably talk to your counsel about to see if that's something that you should take those steps. Um, and there's many different considerations uh, for that decision, including the interplay of state law um, as the state law may require that the holder of that financing contract to automatically cancel and provide a refund. So on that issue, I would talk to your knowledgeable counsel. But as I said before, get a copy of the NADA's model BPP policy and work towards adopting that again with the advice and recommendations of your of your knowledgeable counsel. I can't recommend that highly enough. Um, OK, well, that is it on VPP. So let me dive in real quickly to remote sales. And this is another area that I think um, you really do need to talk to your knowledgeable counsel about conducting remote sales because there are so many traps, both from a federal perspective and a state law perspective that you could really fall into and really not understand that you've fallen into the trap until it's too late. Um, but let's start, you know, what do I mean by um, either offsite or remote sale? Well, um, in the simplest terms, the sales transaction itself um, is completed offsite. It's, it's not completed at the dealership. Maybe it's completed at the customer's home, maybe in their driveway, driveway, or maybe at their place of business. And most of the transaction documents are either executed either online or maybe electronically. Um, and it's important to know that there is a distinction between federal law and state law as different laws could apply to the transaction, right? So let's talk about one of the, the big federal laws that could apply to the transaction if you're not careful. The first is which is the FTC's door-to-door -door sales rule or commonly known as the cooling off rule. Um, what's interesting is this rule has been around for a long time, been around since 1972 Generally, dealers up until the pandemic did not have an issue with this because guess what? You've got consumers coming into your lot. Um, they're visiting your, your lot, looking at the dealership, going, maybe going on a test drive. Generally, has not been an issue uh, with conducting these offsite or remote transactions. Um, the problem is this rule regulates a deal, dealer's ability to engage in sales at a place other than at the dealership, again, at the customer's home or somewhere else. The rule requires disclosures in your sales contract, which most uh, form contracts do not have. Um, it requires disclosures in a separate notice and that you give these disclosures orally. It gives the buyer a three-day right to cancel the transaction. Um, it also prohibits misrepresentations about their right to cancel. And it restricts a seller, a dealer's ability to assign that contract 
to a, say, a third party, maybe your bank or financing source until midnight of the fifth business day. Very restrictive rule that we don't, probably not set up to comply with because we don't have the, 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 the terms in the contract. And it prohibits us from assigning that contract until midnight of the fifth business day. So in short, this cool enough rule gives that customer a chance to kind of cool off from the pressure and the effect of this sales pitch away from the usual place of business, i.e. at the dealership. Um, when does it apply? Well, it applies if a dealer or maybe a dealer's rep personally solicit, solicits a sale of a vehicle for consumer purposes and the buyer agrees to purchase the vehicle at some, again, some other place other than the dealership, then that rule could apply. Now, fortunately, there are some exceptions. Um, the first exception to the rule is where you've got a transaction that is made pursuant to prior negotiations in the course of a visit by the buyer to a retail business establishment. In other words, the consumer came to the dealership first, you negotiated first, um, then we consummated the deal. Then we had the customer sign and maybe deliver the vehicle at their house or, or, at, or at their place of business. That is a prior negotiation in the course of a visit where the customer came first, right? That's one good exception we, we can rely on. Um, another exception where uh, we might have um, is a bona fide immediate personal emergency um, where the consumer says, I've got to have this vehicle today. I need you to bring it out to me. I'm ready to sign today. The trick with that is the customer has to have and sign, um, it has to complete a separately dated and signed personal statement in their own handwriting that, that expresses the, the emergency, tells you about the emergency, and they have to waive their three-day right to cancel. And you can't prompt them as to what to say. So it's a, it's a bit tricky. Uh, to. I've only heard of something like this uh, probably once, and you have to be real careful with it because you can't really prompt them as to what to what to say, and it's a bit tricky to fall within that exception. Another exception is where you have a transaction that's conducted or consummated entirely by mail or telephone and without any other contact between the buyer and the seller or the rep before delivery of the goods or performance. Um, if done correctly, a dealer should be able to apply this exemption where you've got a transaction that, that is conducted remotely, again, by mail or telephone. Now, <clears throat> what about the internet? All right, mail or telephone, kind of old school. What about the internet? Well, even though the language in the rule doesn't include online sales, the FTC does recognize online sales as an exception to the rule in their guidance. So there's additional FTC guidance out there that we, I think we can rely on. Um, we also have some very helpful 2001 FTC guidance from one of their um, their staff attorneys. There's a staff opinion out there that indicates that if you're getting just getting the signature from the customer at their home for a transaction that has been previously negotiated. So everything <clears throat> has been negotiated, includes including the sales price, the financing, and all you're doing is just getting their signature at their home, then um, this should not trigger or implicate the cooling off rule. But think about this, if, if you deliver the car to the customer, maybe you go on a test drive at the house, maybe you're trying to upsell some products or they want additional, say, VPP products there, then you got to be real careful because you might fall into this trap of the cooling off rule if you're upselling or maybe you're adding additional products there. So the rule could apply <clears throat> and then you could uh, be possibly looking at a, a UDAP with some very stiff penalties there. So that is the federal rule. <clears throat> Again, I said it's important to, to distinguish between federal and state because there are state laws that could apply. State home solicitation sales laws could also apply. And in some cases, those state home solicitation sales laws could have similar or maybe in some cases different laws. So you really need to check on your state law requirements as well. And not every state is the same. We've got federal laws, a federal overlay, kind of a think of the rainbow that that you know is over the whole country, but individual pockets of state law could be a little bit different. So, <clears throat> as Patty talked, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Patty talked about the red flags rule. <clears throat> you have to keep that in mind too. Even though you're conducting these remote sales, you still have to comply with yeah. red flags rule. Another tip is, what about your dealer agreement? 
you know, your dealer agreement with your bank or financing source, does that even allow you to conduct these remote sales? You really need to look at your dealer agreement as well. Some of the dealer agreements say and has <clears throat> it has a rep a warrant by the dealer that the entire transaction took place at the dealership's licensed location, i.e. at the dealership. So you may be running afoul of your dealer agreement and may not even know it, not know it unless you read through the dealer agreement. Um, so that's another thing you ought to take a look at. Some helpful tips. You know, again, <clears throat> if you're conducting these sales, make sure that they are fully negotiated <clears throat> before you deliver the vehicle. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cold is kicking in. Um, once the trade-in allowance and other sales price VPPs are negotiated, again, don't try to renegotiate. Follow your red flags and check your dealer agreement, um, you know, whether it permits these offsite sales or not. Um, I told you I would give you a code for spot delivery at the very end. Uh, spot delivery is another publication that, that Patty and I and others in, a, in the firm write for. Um, I've written about remote sales at least three times in spot delivery. So you can take a look at spot delivery uh, <clears throat> if you're interested. In the and the code. nice thing, of, and I'll just kind of give another little plug for the spot delivery. The nice thing about spot delivery, you it's an electron, it's a, a, um, you get it online. And so you can actually do a search. So you can do a search on remote sales, remote deliveries, and it'll pull up all the articles that Eric and others have written on this product. So you get a wealth of information about any topic. You can put safeguards and it'll bring all the articles up. So it's not like, oh, I'm, you know, somebody writing forward. You can look at everything historically we've written about. That's true. Yeah, great, great point. If, if you're interested, <clears throat> we're running a $99 special for one year generally it's 349 and <clears throat> use the code digital age 99 on counselorlibrary.com when you sign up for spot delivery it'll ask for a promo code talk that <clears throat> digital age 99 and you can get a one-year subscription for 99 dollars versus 349 I think that's absolutely terrific. In fact, I subscribe to Spot Delivery, had for years, and any time and every time I have a, an issue or a question, I go right to that Spot Delivery. It is some interesting, I mean, they're very informative. I love it. I can't even imagine doing our business in F&I without Spot Delivery, you know, without our F&I desk book. I mean, that's what we do. It's called rules of engagement, right? We have to have a better understanding of what we're responsible for. So that's why I was so excited to have Hudson and Cook, Patty Covington, and Eric Johnson here to really just kind of, I wish we could even do a deeper dive. It's just amazing. Some of these changes and updates, what's going on in our industry. And we just really need to have to sharpen up that pencil get out those books and see what's going on. We have to protect ourselves because if in the event of some sort of, like you said, identity theft, prevention of fraud, things like that, that's on us. Unless of course we have these right processes in place. So you make it a point, make it a point to uh, make sure you get that email in there on the chat you in and sign up for that spot delivery as well as that F and I desk book. And, and guys, I can't thank you enough for being here on this F and I uh, master series a forum, the digital age event. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate and appreciate your time. Thank, thank you for you. having us, Becky. Any last words? Well, thank you. Just really pay attention right now. There's a lot happening in the compliance area. Your attorneys generals, your federal regulators, they're looking to enforce. That's just the environment we work in now. And there are lots of good um, resources out there to help you. So um, if we can ever be of assistance, we're happy to help. Thank yeah. you again, guys. Great job. Perfect job. Right. Thank you. Thank Hope you. you have a fabulous conference. And everybody pay attention to everything she has to say. We've got some great speakers. I am so psyched up. I mean, we really do. And thank you again, guys. It's happy to do it. It was great. Yeah, to do it. Thank you. Thank you.
At Audify, we power the end-to-end digital sales and finance experiences of the most innovative brands and deliver funded deals. And we're excited to build upon this with the launch of the next evolution of our commerce platform, Deal Center. Deal Center extends the deal-making power of the sales desk to everyone in the dealership, from your BDC, sales, F&I, and management, and it empowers them to more effectively work deals in the showroom and online in a shared experience with the customer. Deal Center enables your team to present side-by-side vehicle comparisons with details of the deal, send remote deals, and pencil deals alongside the customer. It helps your management quarterback the sales floor and structure deals in seconds, run soft credit pools, and gain visibility into important financial calculations. And it adds efficiency to your finance process by enabling a customer to complete a digital credit app and receive firm offers of credit in real time. Dealers using Deal Center see more trust, efficiency, and profitability in their sales process. So if you're ready to enable your team with a digital platform that will supercharge their performance, get started with Deal Center today. Reach out to us to learn more. Wise, welcome. It is so great to have you here at the Evanai Master Series Forum, the Digital Age. And, you know, for our dealers and viewers, first and foremost, I think what we need to do is could you explain your background, um, where you've been, who you've been with, and also currently you're now with AutoFi. So explain your role, what's going on, Carrie? Yes. Thank you for having me. First of all, I think this is my first time speaking at this event. So I'm honored to be a part of it. I know you've been doing some amazing work over the last couple decades. Um, and so thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Carrie Wise. I have been working in auto for 23 years. Uh, and I have a very unique background in terms of my career history. Uh, never thought I would end up in automotive, but, but started at JD Power and Associates. And yeah. Um, really focused on more of kind of the sales and service oriented research um, and consulting. And I worked with dealers and OEMs on kind of how do we take the consumer insights and turn it into action, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was the start of my career, moved on to Edmunds.com and launched their Mm -hmm. dealer business. Okay. Um, at, at, at that point, I was in training. So I had a field team that went into stores and, and helped them understand how to make the best out of the Edmunds platform um, and eventually moved to marketing and went on to True Car, which at the time was kind of shaking things up a little bit in the industry with uh, price transparency and led marketing for them. I was also kind of an evangelist in the industry, helping them understand kind of price transparency and where that was going. And that was kind of the hot yeah. thing, Big. right? Which oh, yeah. shook the industry up a little bit. Uh, and then recently, over, it's been a year now, almost uh, last Gosh, April, that I joined Audify and um, really excited about Audify because I get to take all that history um, and really work directly with dealers and enabling them to be more efficient, to have a digital presence that allows them to compete with the modern day um, giants and disruptors out there. And it, that's exciting to, to kind of solely work with, with dealers now and other sellers and retailers. Well, there you go to new heights and you continue to do that and just spread the word. And it is amazing what you have done for our industry. Let me just say that you're just remarkable. I love your forward thinking ideas. And that's just what you are. I mean, it's just awesome to see and hear. And I've seen, I can't tell you how many presentations over the year you do amazing. So that's why I'm saying it is exciting, sir, to have you here, Carrie, on this event. So very exciting industry, right? And so I think for me, I've always wanted to kind of work at companies that were somewhat pushing that envelope. 
Um, and, and, but ultimately helping dealers, right? Like that's, yeah. that's what we all want to do is right. Help dealers move forward um, so that we could be successful ultimately. Yeah. I think that's always been your goal. I know it's always been my goal as well. And sometimes, you know, pay, a change is painful a little yeah. bit, right? But it's necessary. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to reinvent um, and just um, just reinvent the whole process. I think if we can tweak some of it, right, we can implement some of these best practices that really can make a big difference. hundred percent. So there's been this digital retailing buzzword <laughs> going on in the past five years. And so some dealers feel like, okay, well, it's a plug and play. I'm going to put this DR on my website. Let's have fun with it. And customers will like it to some degree. And that's about it. But what you're saying is, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yes. We not only want that experience, but we also want to connect those dots Absolutely. to the in dealership experience. I'm going to let you take that one. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Digital retailing is absolutely the buzzword. You know, I try not to call Autofy a digital retailing company, but ultimately you get cornered because that is the word that everybody knows. I like to think of us as a commerce platform because okay. ultimately digital retailing is retailing, right? Like digital retailing is retailing, meaning that you're trying to sell a car and yes, you want to give a customer the opportunity to do it from end to end online. But the reality is that the majority of customers aren't going to do everything online, right? Buying a car is very complicated. And so even though consumers want the flexibility to do as much or as little as they want online, ultimately, they're likely to interact with someone in your BDC still, someone in your internet sales staff. They're likely to still interact with people in the showroom. Mm -hmm. And I think so we have to think about digital retailing less about the widget on the site and more about the people and the process and where the disconnect happens is when those are not aligned. And so would you say that your dealership personnel really need to be a part of this integration Absolutely. process and how I think you mentioned as well, some technology and how we can integrate that technology with what's going in the dealership. Absolutely. So I, I think, you know, you have to start online in terms of, are we enabling uh, the purchase experience online like it would in the showroom, right? Are we enabling the same um, customer experience, efficiency flow? And so I, a lot of times I will look online and see about your CTAs, your call to actions, the flow, the user experience. It's not just the widget, it's, it's how the experience is being presented to the customer. Are we enabling them to do everything they can do in the showroom online, right? That's getting a trade value. That's configuring a payment. That's getting approved for a loan, right? All of those things we have to think about, right? First and foremost. And the, the, the reality is that when it comes to digital retailing, there's a lot of providers out there, but many providers are still thinking about digital retailing as a lead generation. Okay. And I think th that is kind of why digital retailing and sometimes can has a bad, bad word. It's a bad word in some ways, right? Because it's just another lead. I think we need to think about how do we enable an experience that looks like the showroom, the accuracy of the showroom, the efficiency, the customer experience. Uh, but you asked about people. And I think the second part, once we get past the online experience is how do we arm our people? with the digital um, efficiency, these tools, right? Because we could all agree that the reality is the, the showroom experience isn't overly efficient. I whispered that because I felt bad saying it, right? Well, but reality, but you said it, not me, <laughs> but it's there's true. A, there's bottlenecks, right? <laughs> yes. The negotiation experience, there's a lot of back and forth. The F&I experience, there's bottlenecks waiting in to get into F&I. The experience takes four to five hours still. To this day, I've been talking about four to five hours, it feels like for decades now. <laughs> and so how do we use digital to arm your people, to empower your people, not to replace them, um, a couple examples of that. So 
you know, we at Audify um, have what we call a remote deal tool that we and we give our, our sales team what we call deal center. And they can send a link to a customer who starts the experience online, drops off and continue that experience. Because the reality is that the customer might get a payment configuration. They might get a trade. The salesperson has that information in their deal center back end tool and well, you got to pick the deal up where it left off. And so sending them a link, inviting them to continue the experience with you as a salesperson in a shared experience, even over the phone, is a way to keep that experience going. And I feel like that is very important. I can't begin to tell you how many dealerships that I have been in um, as much as you and be, and and I know how disconnected that is from where the customer is shopped online, once they get into the dealership, it's like all bets are off. We're going to yeah. start this all over again. And so the consumer customer is thinking, well, why did I go through all the other stuff online and to start all over again? And you're so right when we talk about this F&I bottleneck mm -hmm. that doesn't have to happen. And through leveraging your technology, we can cut down on the time it takes for that customer to buy the car, picking it up right from online, like you said, bringing it in dealership, giving the empowerment of your sales associates to have the ability to connect with that customer, engage with that customer, right? And yeah. walk them through uh, their, their terms. We find that when the dealership is using technology like a remote deal when they're using iPads that have the same digital experience as they're presenting on their website, consumers are much more likely to continue the process when they disconnect. They're much more likely to engage with F and I products. We find our online customers are choosing two F and I products before they even talk to anybody. Wow. Um, right. And they're much more likely to close, right? The, the close rate is two to three times higher. And I should mention one more thing is the profitability. The profitability is higher. We see about a $500 increase in PVR when they're using digital technology and the experience. So, you know, I think we really have to combat the perception that digital is going to be a race to the bottom, that it's going to replace my people. Um, digital enhances the experience that automates that experience and allows you and your A players to do the stuff they do well, right? And that's what we're really trying to get at by introducing digital into that showroom experience. And I and I I I feel like that is so important. I have and I people, and I have these groups, as you all know, in Facebook, and I have the Evan I Today group, and and their concern is wait a minute this is going to replace me. Mm -hmm. um, this is not something that I want to embrace. And I'm not saying just in DR, because I don't think that they truly understand the idea behind it and how it can actually in increase that PVR and make a difference. So when a customer has the idea or has an understanding of these products beforehand, and as you know, growing up in the business, it mm -hmm. was always don't talk about that stuff, whatever you do, wait until the customer gets into this F and I office, and then we'll go ahead and close them down. So yes, this is the opposite of something that they've ever been trained to do. And they're feeling like right now they're pretty successful the way that they are. But what they're not realizing is that, again, giving customers the tools to be able to do that shopping to determine and have a better understanding of these product knowledge, I would imagine, what you're saying. Yeah. So when they get into that or engage with that finance person, it's not so overwhelming. Absolutely. I think, you know, the 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 10-step sales process, we're kind of shaking it up. It, it's not as linear of a purchase experience as it used to be. And I think when you look at, there's a study by JD Power, I think it showed 45% of customers are looking to research financing before they ever leave their home, right? They're using financing as a way to figure out what vehicle they can afford. They're looking for it to figure out like, can they actually um, 
Uh, is this the right vehicle for them? And so we have to stop thinking about financing as just the ultimate last step when most shoppers are payment shoppers. So if we don't, we don't jump into this game, one, I don't want to use the disruptors out there, but we have to think about their market share and they're gaining market share, right? Because they're interacting with the customer in the way the customer wants. So that's one thread. Um, but more importantly, the dealership down the street that enables a customer to configure a payment, right? To understand what they can afford, to shop for vehicles based on payment. That is a dealership that's going to engage with the customer that might pass you up. You'll never even have a chance at that with certain customers. Well, I'm telling you right now, Carrie, I don't know if you realize this or not, but you're talking my language. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over that. I yeah. really am. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, why shouldn't a customer have the education, have a better understanding of what they qualify for yes. earlier on, as soon as possible? Why are, why are we waiting until the, that, like you said, the, like the last step that just doesn't make any sense to me? Well, and with technology, it makes all of us smarter. It doesn't replace the, the work, but it makes us smarter. So you think about your phone, right? Like oh, you're yeah. not looking at a map anymore. You, when you want to go somewhere, you're using Google map or whatever you prefer. And that's what you're using to get you there. You still got to drive. You still have to do the work, but it made it a little easier and more efficient. Right. And I think about technology in the same way. You know, we have a dealership that has enabled their BDC to be able to quote a payment. Shocking. I know people are like, whoa, never, <laughs> never, right? The BDC's job is to just get them in for the appointment. Uh, but the reality is that this dealership had the challenge that most BDCs have, where the customer is like, I'm not driving 45 miles until you give me an idea of the payment. I'm not coming in. Yeah. And so with technology and automation, it can enable a BDC rep to actually quote an accurate price, right? Or work with the customer in a shared experience because the customer is telling us their terms. They're telling us their credit, credit score. They're telling us whether they want to finance, purchase, or lease. They're even filling out a credit application where we can pull us, we can get a soft pull, right? Amen. And actually pull their credit score. So with our algorithm and technology, we could actually figure out based on that credit score, based on the customer's profile, and based on the parameters that the dealer set up, what banks are going to be the right banks to put in front of them? And you're you're putting that in the hands of a BDC. Now, that's not for everybody. I don't want to scare everybody on this um, uh, <laughs> conference that that's where it's going. I'm just saying that that's an extreme example of you know, maybe the most inexperienced person in the dealership as it relates to F&I could at least get the process started with a customer that is that that is demanding that level of service. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I might just blow you away, Carrie. I actually agree with you. <laughs> and I can't begin to tell you how many times I've said to a dealer, are we training up our BDC? And can they actually provide customers with information, realistic information as it pertains to terms, as it pertains to financing to some degree. Because yeah. when we can't answer those questions, just get them in the dealership. That's all we want to do. Just get them in the dealership. The problem with that, I mean, I understand it, but when mm -hmm. we do that and we have customers traveling three hours away or two hours away from, from their home to come to the dealership and only to find out that they don't qualify for that vehicle. And right, you want to right. talk about the experience then? And they say, well, just make it more, you know, this um, DR experience is just not as friendly as that in person. I'm like, well, I can tell you right now, they're not going to be too friendly when they're all coming two hours and coming in and finding out that they don't qualify for this vehicle and there's no other vehicles for them to maybe consider because... Yeah. And I can't emphasize enough the fact that accuracy needs to be there, right? You need to partner with a digital retailing platform or commerce platform platform that's going to enable a high level of accuracy. I call it showroom accuracy. Well, okay. Right? 
right? Yeah. So, so, you know, there are, there are the good and the bad and, and not everyone is as accurate, right? With, in terms of taxes and fees and the local, the local information, right? At the local yeah. level, oh, um, right? right. And, and the rebates and incentives from the manufacturer and subvention when it matters, all of that needs to be accounted for in order to, to, to quote a customer, a real payment. But, but that being said, when we get past that, um, it, it's a good experience. It's a win-win because the customer is going to feel more confident. We find that when the customer is more confident, that when we put a little bit more control in their hands, right? Perceived control because it's still um, based on the parameters that the dealer is comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Customers will spend more money, right? We, we talk about F and I product presentation, right? Yeah. Um, who would be upset that the customer on their own chose two point two? F and I products before they came in. Like, why would that be a bad thing? What we often find is even if the customer chooses those two products, now they're in front of the F and I director. The F and I director can go through the products they didn't choose. And 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 once again have a second chance at bat yep. to say, hey, I noticed you didn't choose gap insurance. I want to make sure you understand right what this is and the benefits. I think you. it's the concept, it's yeah. understanding it. So you may know my background in that years back when I was working with JMA, and I get promoted to this automation division and everybody thought, what are you doing this for, Becky? Get back in the box. And the whole idea was we were presenting menu and this was a brand new concept. And it was, what do you mean? Customer understand the terms of the sale. What do you mean? The customer understands their payment and the product offerings all in advance. And everybody and their mother said, there's no way in heck this is going to work. It's just not going to work. Don't you know? It's never going to work. And I can't begin to tell you the naysayers that told me, I don't know what you're doing, yeah. but you need to, you need to stop. You need to go do something different because this yeah. is going to fall apart. And it didn't. So no, of course it, not. it just didn't. And it was beautiful because I learned and it was different for me. It was complete opposite of anything that I was ever done ever, you know, before that made me very successful. Yeah. We met customers out at that sales at that kiosk in the middle of the showroom. It just mm -hmm. blew me away. It blew everyone away. But so I, I, I just want to say something else to that. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a dealership in a franchise store and I'm training. And I meet the customer at the salesperson's desk and I'm so used to now presenting the menu there. I don't need to present a, a menu to a customer in an F&I office. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if you're comfortable there, I'm good. Let's go. Mm -hmm. The dealer was so uncomfortable with that. He's like, what are you doing? Why would you do that? And I said, would it be okay that if I just told you right now, the customer just, just purchased three products from me, are we mm -hmm. okay with that? He's like, really? It's concept. They just, once they understand and own it, that you, like you said, give control to get control. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you think about other industries and, and where they are on this kind of digital um, journey. And I think about Rocket Auto. This is a good example. Or I, sh I should say Rocket Mortgage, right? They actually have an auto division. Oh, yeah. Rocket yeah, yeah, yeah. Mortgage, right? I bought a house primarily through my phone, right? I bought a house through my phone. Now, was there people involved? A hundred percent, right? That there were people that interacted, but even when they interacted with me, it was still through a digital experience. When they uploaded forms, they did it through the app, right? And so we oftentimes put roadblocks in front of us on what is not possible. And if you don't think it's possible, it's not possible. Your people won't think it's possible. They're going to kill it. But if you could buy a house using digital technology, then no one can tell me that we can't use digital to improve the car buying experience. So I will tell you, um, and I don't know if you know Brian Kramer. Yes, yes, oh. I do. I've met him a couple of times. He's amazing. Yes. I mean, you talk about the most m moving forward GM. Right. Trailblazer. <laughs> he really is. No, he really is. And he's a good person. He's just a good person and great leader. Great leader. 
So I'm talking to his f and person, and she's talking to me about, in fact, she will also be on this event talking about her digital journey from tradition to um, finalizing this transaction completely digital. Yeah. And it was very, very intimidating. But here's what she said that I was just told me before when we were talking, she was telling me that if it were up to her, she wouldn't have done it at all, mm. at all. And yeah. she said, if it weren't for Brian and his stick to he, it wasn't like, Oh, I think he's got a comment that he makes. Um, this is the ship it's in. We have one ship. It's in the Harbor and it's, that's it. Right. So it's <laughs> this ship, it's in my Harbor or something like that. Anyway. Right. So, um, but she said that was his position period. He didn't waver. This is what he was going to do come heck or high water. And that's what they did. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I don't want to necessarily put you on the spot here, no, okay. <laughs> but where is this change coming from? Is it coming from the FNI person or is it coming from the top? Is it coming from the GMs like Brian? Well, in, ter in terms of change, any change, it has to come from the top. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, when I talk about best practices on digital retailing and I speak about that, that's the first best practice, right? Is that you have to have leadership buy-in. Yeah. You have to have, and then, and then you could filter that down to management and down to your people. But if it doesn't start at the top, it's likely not going to be executed on. And so for us, that, that's really important to get, to get that buy-in, mm -hmm. to help the managers understand what's in it for them, to help the people understand what's in it for them. But you need a Brian Kramer to start it off with. <laughs> and you can't waver. So like yes. I give Jermaine, his dealer, a lot of credit. Yeah, here absolutely. comes. Well, he 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 decided to move on this at the right time. Yeah, and I think you know it, it's like anything in business. Um, if you're doing things solely based on profitability, mm -hmm. it, it's somewhat of a short-term thinking. I'm talking about profitability today. That's right. Ultimately, we run businesses. We need to be profitable. But if you're only looking at how do I make money today and you're not thinking about where things are going and the future where it's going, mm -hmm. you're going to probably be left behind. And so oftentimes we hear of disruptors out there like a Carvana and people will say, well, they're not profitable. You know, they're going to go on, go under. And there's oh, yeah. talk about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And who knows? I, I'm not an expert on, on their business model. But but what I would say is. Look at a company like Amazon. Amazon, as I understand it, did not make profit for nine or 10 years. Mm -hmm. When you're pushing towards a new business model that has never been done before, you're likely going to sacrifice short-term profit to put you in a position that you're going to be dominating from a long-term standpoint. And I think as when it comes to our industry, sometimes we can be very short-term thinking, right? Even right now, you're starting to see it where we're making so much money given the circumstances of the last couple of years that in some ways, some people are taking their foot off the gas. Yes. They're they taking are. their foot off the gas. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And it's, it's, it's interesting to watch. Um, yeah. and, and because, again, it's so right now easy. Right. Yes. They pretty much control it all. So I'll just keep on doing what I've always been doing. That makes me um, more profitable today. And unfortunate yep. to that, the skill set, when it's all coming back to some sort of normalcy, where will that skill set be? Where is the direction? Where's the culture of that dealership and the processes that really help to, them to manage that better? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I don't, I, I started my career in consumer insights, right, in the automotive industry. And I don't want to make it that it's only about the consumer, because ultimately, the business has to see the ROI as well. But I truly believe what I've heard from the founder of Amazon and other leaders that the consumer is going to drive the change, right? They're going to demand a certain experience they're going to push the industry and we are in a world where digital is, is accelerating that is accelerating that. And so I think that we have to listen to the customer. 
we can't just sit on uh, rest on our laurels or what has worked for us in the past. And if I was, if I owned a dealership right now, I would look at the experience. I would shake it all up and say, let me, let me start from a fresh, fresh piece of paper. Yeah. What's working for us? What can we keep that we, we should keep because the traditions have worked and what's not working, right? What's not working? What's not going to work long-term? I think we have to look at our process from a, from a fresh lens. And you know what? The, the time to do that is now. Yes. I mean, it couldn't be a better time. Because yeah, we're just, I mean, we don't have all this volume that we can step all over ourselves with. So at this point, now is the time to do what Brian did. And you're exactly right. He rolled up his sleeves and he goes, let's look at this from all angles. And yeah, it, it, it is absolutely the, the time. And, and what I would say is that it's not a one size fits all for all dealers. You know, I don't want to simplify this that. Every dealer should do what Brian Kramer is doing. Or a lot of times we talk about Brian Ben stock and there's these guys out there that are, and gals that are really pushing the envelope. It may not be for your brand or you might be in a different region that what they're doing may or may not work. That's true. But what I would say is put your foot in the water though, right? Start somewhere, start somewhere. So maybe that's going to be uh, embracing the uh, cust enabling customers to get a payment and customize their payments online. And maybe that's get getting a trade value, or maybe that's allowing them to get approved for a loan like you can through our, our platform. But I think we got to start somewhere. There is no room for watching on the sidelines, or I'm afraid that when things return back to normal, we're going to be really frustrated at those disruptors that are gaining market share. Keep doing what you're doing. And like I said, I love where I enjoy working with you and I enjoy following you and your messages. I mean, they're just very positive. Thank very you. Positive. If there's Thank anything I can do for you, you let me know. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. And I look forward to seeing everyone in, in Atlanta. It's going to be fun. We're going to do this. We yes. are going to do this yes. in the fall. We, it, we're building up the momentum and Autofy is kicking it off again. Appreciate you having us. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again. Customer A visits your website and is interested in purchasing a vehicle. They fill out an interest form with a name and email and wait for your team to respond. Customer B visits your website and is interested in the same vehicle. Only this customer has clicked the Get Pre-Qualified button on your inventory page. Within seconds, you have access to a FICO score, open trade lines, and other useful credit and contact information. Which of these leads would you rather work? Quick Qualify is a software solution offering a call to action lead form that can be integrated into digital retailing, dealership websites, email marketing, live chat, and in store applications. Once completed, the form provides consumers their credit score for free while providing dealers detailed credit information on a warm lead. Using Quick Qualify on your dealership website enables consumers to get pre-qualified at the top of the sales funnel, improving both your sales cycle and the customer's buying experience. With a credit file in hand, your team can start their process more confidently and have closing conversations earlier in the sales cycle, helping you close deals faster. Drive more qualified leads. Gain visibility into credit worthiness before a customer even visits your dealership. Hold deal gross and sell more cars. If you're ready to get more actionable data regarding your consumers earlier in the sales process so you can close deals faster, then give 700 Credit a call today. Ken Hill, it is certainly a pleasure to have you here with our FNI Master Series Forum, The Digital Age. And, you know, so to get everyone um, to get, I want, uh, I want to make sure that everyone has a good background for um, who is Ken Hill, what is 700 Credit, and sure. kind of, well, I can't imagine that people wouldn't know 700 Credit, but just 
kind of, if you will, just give us a background on you as well as 700 Credit. Sure, absolutely. And, and thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, I'm the managing director of 700 Credit. Uh, I've been in the automotive industry with credit for about 25 years. And um, I've been with 700 Credit about 15. And uh, 700 Credit is the largest provider of credit reports in the automotive industry. We serve about uh, 14,500 dealers and uh, our drive is to constantly grow that number and expand our family. Um, and uh, so, uh, and we're very involved in sort of the next phase of credit. Credit reports have been around forever, being utilized by dealerships forever. And now that we're starting to um, really see penetration in the market of dealers utilizing soft pulls. And it's really around education and uh, ensuring dealerships understand how it helps their process, how it helps their sales process. Well, Ken, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, I think, you know, from my conversations and I'm in dealerships all over the country and I still, and maybe it's just because of my past experience as the host of the FNI Today show as well, but getting experts in and, you know, talking about what's happening in the industry. But a lot of these guys still don't understand soft pull versus, you know, what yeah. is that versus a hard inquiry? Sure. So be, to get us started, what exactly is a soft pull versus a hard inquiry? For sure. So, um, and, and, and there's a, there's also a, a misunderstanding that, oh, I just, I, I don't want to just add on. Uh, to my my credit bills, so you know I'm not interested. Um, but so a soft inquiry, and I, let me just I have uh, I'm just going to share a slide here. I have um, a couple of uh, slides that sort of help my discussion. So it's uh, just not me, and you're staring at all my hand uh, motions, which <laughs> are frequent. Um, so uh, basically, a soft pull is a, a soft inquiry and versus a hard inquiry dealerships today pull credit reports that's a hard inquiry uh the, the it's placed on their credit file lending institutions see them dealerships see them any anytime their credit's accessed they see hard inquiries um, and they can impact a consumer's fico score uh, especially when you start getting a lot of hard inquiries in a short period of time, it's going to impact the consumer score. So a soft inquiry does not impact the consumer's score and can only be seen by the consumer. Um, and it's also, they require less information, uh, which uh, the benefits we'll talk about a little um, later and, and how that impacts um, engagement, but it, they require less information and and they do not impact the consumer score. So if a uh, dealership does a soft inquiry and then they send the loan to the lender, uh, the lender will see that score that the dealership pulled, but and it won't see the soft inquiry that the dealership see. Only consumers um, can see uh, a, a soft inquiry. Um, so some of the dealers have asked, okay, um, about this soft pull, but is it compliant? Is it, you know, are we a, you know, what is the better way to obtain that information? Would it be better to do this soft pull? Is it okay to do and versus this hard inquiry? Right. So, um, uh, soft inquiries typically, um, there's two types, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about that pre-screen and pre-qualification. Uh, the main difference is that a pre-screen, a consumer doesn't un know that it, it happened. And a pre-qualification, the consumer has given their consent up front uh, to go ahead and look at my credit and, and not impact my score. Um, pre-screen, the consumers don't know. Uh, we all often um, compare with your pre-approved credit card offers you get in the mail um, uh, with a pre-approved credit card, you don't know that they did a pre-screen, but they did. Uh, and if you were actually to go to a, um, a website like Credit Karma and view your credit report, you would see that pre-approved credit card offer, that finance institution or that pre-approved refinancing offer or 
reconsolidation or loan, auto loan, um, you would see an inquiry on your file from that institution, but only you can see that. Uh, it doesn't set off inquiry alerts on your files either because it, there's no impact to the consumer at all. Um, in fact, if you viewed your credit report on Credit Karma, there would be an inquiry from Credit Karma on your credit file. Uh, um, it's the law that's anytime somebody looks, including your own self, anytime someone looks at a credit file, that inquiry is, is placed on the file. So um, the, the benefit is, you know, is for dealerships to use them early in that sales cycle. So let's talk a little bit about that. How does the saw pull really help in that dealership sales process? Okay, sure. So um, here is a traditional sales funnel, uh, whether it be in the front of the store or whether it would be uh, online, right? The traditional sales funnel, the consumer shops for a vehicle, either again in the store or online, they're interested. Uh, maybe they're in the store. They're being told their monthly payment's going to be, you know, X three. Let's say three fifty a month, or online digital experience, or the in, the, the dealer uh, consumer engagement tool online. They're being quoted three fifty through the tool, um, and they get to the the finance office. They're all set. They're excited. They pull their credit report, and uh, finance friction uh, occurs. What we call finance office friction in that, uh, well, your, your credit is, is telling me I got to send you this lender over here and the best interest rate they have is this, your payment's going to be 400 to four and a quarter. That's that, that payment friction. Um, so, you know, that, that causes problems. It causes um, a lot of problems, yeah. you know, especially when you get that deal from the desk and maybe, you know, they didn't quite check it out. They penciled the deal and let's go, you know, assuming customers had that, you know, that prime credit, they're all dressed up looking pretty good. So what the heck? I mean, we've been hit with that many a time in that F&I office. And I got to tell you, I mean, it makes for a really tough way to go because now we got to figure out a way. Do we have a customer on the right car? What do we need to do to go ahead and keep this deal, um, you know, uh, deliver this car? And God forbid you, you have to, uh, you know, cut the cost of the car to get that payment down, right? That comes right out of your bottom line. We don't want to do that right now. No, or maybe you got to send the customer away, ask for more deposit or pay down, get their credit score up, pay down their debt. It's, it's, it's just not, it's not good. So, um, so this is, this is how soft pulls impact the dealership sales cycle throughout the dealership's life cycle. Uh, and um, it's, it's getting, that soft inquiry, whether it's a prequal or pre-screen, at the top of the sales funnel, so that I have a better understanding of where that customer uh, lays in the credit spectrum, and also what my fi financing options are when I go to the finance office. and And um, digital retailing tools are perfect examples when they're using pre-qualification; they're using the consumer's actual FICO score. Uh, early on in the process to calculate accurate payments in the tool. Um, we see a lot of digital retailing companies fail because they're using consumer self-reported scores, right? And um, in the, and there's no other options. So a consumer is going to say, Oh, my credit's a 700. <laughs> but meanwhile, uh, you know, their credit's really a 650 or a 675. They're 700. They got off credit karma which isn't a FICO score, it's a, um, like a Vantage score, so it doesn't translate to FICO, and, and it's not, we stress this a lot, the importance we align dealerships with the Bureau and the exact FICO score that they use in the finance office inside these tools, such as a digital retailing tool. Um, and it, that, that self consumer self-reported score, it, it creates that, that finance office friction again because it's, it's, not, it's not accurate. So incorporating that soft pull into the process allows you to zero in those payments and get them as close to penny perfect as you can. Well, I think that that's really kind of ideal because, you know, coming from a retail um, background myself and working, you know, with Prime and Subprime, and in fact, in 
a career one time. It was, I was called Wonder Woman, go <laughs> figure. And, and the thing that I can relate to that is every customer I talk to on the phone, I, I really wanted to have a better understanding of that customer before they got into the dealership and managed to find the wrong car. It right. just didn't make any sense. And I made more profit, sold more cars as Wonder Woman, making sure that that customer and understanding the customer's credit criteria, where were we, you know, what's going on with their income, things like that. But it's just as important, just realizing what we're up against to put a good deal together yeah. and you know it's just stream streamlines the process i mean yeah. efficiency is key to mm -hmm. improved profits period yeah. Yeah. so it just stands to reason that if we can integrate um a soft pull into that dr experience and get as much information as we possibly can I think it makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. And that's, um, I think, you know, you being a former sales rep, when we, when we show these tools to sales reps, they're like, wow, it's, 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 it's getting this information into the dealership and pushed down to the sales rep and they'll sell it for us, uh, implementing this because they understand the power of that information at the point of the sale. And, and I think um, we have some really good digital retailing partners that do a really good job of ensuring that 80 to 90 percent of those consumers coming through the digital retailing tool are pre-qualified. It just empowers that sales rep so much more in that and especially that remote communication experience. Um, it, it's really empowering the, the sales reps. Well, the whole idea, right? Uh, and this is what I understand um, the message was at NADA is really connecting the dots with that customer, mm -hmm. really creating a more um, process driven engagement. And right. I mean, it would seem to me that I'll use the term unplugged <laughs> 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 that. You know, okay, well, you may say your FICO score 700, but when we get back into the dealership again, here's where the friction, like you said, begins because now all of a sudden they're not at that 700 and now all of a sudden terms have to change and now we get into the grind all over again. Right. And that's what we want to get away from. We want to connect that, merge that, so that way we can reduce any of that happening, right? Yeah, we often say that it certainly makes it makes for a smoother sales process. Um, it makes for a faster sales process because I, I'm removing all that friction um, and I'm getting I'm a, a, I'm zooming the consumer in on the right deal. You know, shop by payment, credit first, all those types of slogans. It, it helps. And it ends up being a better customer experience, right? Because um, when you you talk to the consumer and and maybe adjust their expectations at the top, uh, they're much happier than when you do it at the bottom. Right? Uh, you know, I'm all excited. I get to the finance office. No, oh, I can't. I can't have that car. Or well, you know, it's. Uh, at the top, okay, okay, well, this one's not bad, right? So let me ask you this. I mean, I think we are talking, we're definitely on the same page, and, you know, I, we talk the same language. Why do you suppose we have some dealers out there that don't see the, uh, or the need behind that soft pull before, and I think you have a slogan, credit first versus credit last. Yep. Why yes. do you suppose they just, I don't know, they just don't see or understand the importance of the soft pull yeah. before we get into the minutia of the deal? Why is that? Um, well, I, there's there's a couple of common, and I would call them, you know, I, I wouldn't call them valid. I would call them, you know, common concerns that we hear from dealerships. Certainly cost is one of them. I'm just adding to my cost. Yeah, but, you know, with some of these products, they're going to increase your sales, right? And, you know, how many sales do you need to cover a hundred bucks a month? Um, you know, uh, not many. Uh, so there, that's a common concern, right? We have uh, some finance uh, managers that are, are very focused on cost 
And uh, so that's a concern. The other concern that we hear often is that they don't, um, they're afraid to empower their sales team because they'll feel that if their sales team knows that score at the top of the funnel, they won't handle it the right way. Or maybe mm -hmm. he's going to focus only on 700s above uh, that internet office manager is only going to focus on 700 above. And, um, and I think those, both of those items can be managed. And, um, and so it's, it's just, so it's, can I ask you this? So I know we talk about, and I just want to clear, clear it up a bit. So when we're talking about the sales rep, are we talking about the sales manager? Are we talking about BDC? You know, where is all this happening? Um, yep. where, you know, is it the BDC that has obviously the information that the customer is either a prime or, mm. um, less than prime or subprime who has this information? Where's this, where's this going? It, it, it's, it, I always say it's tough to put a dealership's process inside a box and everyone works the same way. Right? That's it's, right. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's impossible. And, you know, and we have a lot of people with much more experience than me that really have a firm core belief in the way they do things inside the big dealership. So it's sort of tough to move them off that. Um, and, uh, but it, it, it's used by all those aspects you mentioned, uh, BDC, right? We, um, let's start there, right? We have pre-screen inside your data, data mining tools, your service lane sales tools. Um, you know, are those being handled by the BDC? And often they are right. Trying to drive more, um, foot traffic into the dealership by those outbound database mining and pre-screen can be used there by uh, insight in the conquest customers, right? Uh, consumers who did not purchase the vehicle in your store, but had it serviced in that store. That's 40 to 50% of the service lane traffic. And typically those deals are untouched by the service lane sales tools. Uh, and by the database mining tools off of that traffic, it, they're untouched. And uh, pre-screen enlightens and adds data, appends data to those leads, those conquest leads, giving those tools the insight they need to, to, to push offers up to the BDC and to the sales team that are available to those consumers. Because pre-screen has how many months they have left on their loan, how much they owe on their loan. Um, you know, their current monthly payment, their current interest rate. So all that data can drive those offer programs inside those database mining, those service lane tools. So, so that is really interesting. So basically using that pre-screen capability, um, we can do a deeper dive into those customers that likely may be um, eligible to get out from under their trade and maybe into another vehicle almost same like payment and we would have that information earlier on to be able to um discuss those options with the customer time of service exactly right uh this this guy just drove in the service lane didn't purchase the car uh at, at my store but i can see he's got six months left uh he owes about two thousand his vehicle's worth five thousand just rough numbers Okay. Um, so he's got 3000 of equity. So I can hammer that into a, a very common payment rather than put a thousand dollars into that car with your equity. Plus that thousand, I can lower your monthly payment and you're walking out of here with a new car. Right. Uh, so that's the kind of a conversation it can drive or simple things is like these, Here's a hundred customers that came into our service lane three months ago, whose lease or loan is up in, in, in two months, three months, they get, they gotta be getting ready to, to shop. Let's, let's send them some offers. Let's give them a phone call to see if they're interested and, and what kind of offer and opportunity we might have now. That's, you know, it's a typical BDC driven. So to answer your original question, who's using that data, it's used throughout this, the, the, the process inside the dealership right uh somebody walks in uh, into the front of the store right let's pre-screen them in the crm as soon as we have their data maybe as soon as we scan their driver's license let's pre-screen them so not only can i you know, validate the license get the data into the crm 
but I know right away where the credit spectrum is before I even have that first sales conversation with them and I can adjust my pitch. So, you know, who's, who's delivering that information to that sales rep? Is it the sales manager or is it automated in the tool that that information is being, is being pushed to that person working that deal? So I mentioned earlier, it's throughout the life cycle. It truly can be used throughout the, the you know, the life cycle of the dealership. Well, we talk a lot about that because it's not just about one sale. Right. Right. It yeah. is about a reoccurring customer and retention and um, and being able to get back in front of that customer again and again yeah. and in those touch points and yes. having an educated conversation. And and you talked before about what are some of the obstacles and um, it's it's not easy sometimes talking to his dealership and trying to convince them they need to change or update or uh, enhance a little bit their process for how they're selling vehicles, something they've been doing, again, longer than you know I've been here. So uh, that, that can be a difficult conversation. But it, to your point, right, it's uh, there's so many more touch points and, and conquest customers, um, better sales cycle. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I had a conversation um, the other day and it and having BDC and training up BDC, maybe it's just that mm, someone who's a manager that hopefully had come from um, either top management, because I think that person needs to be talented. We're, you know, we're, I don't want to put a BDC person in there that has lack of talent. We have not, we have nowhere else to put them. Let's just put them in BDC. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing. But a manager really needs to be there and be able to have that conversation with a customer as it pertains to terms or what they may qualify for. If they ask one of the most frustrating thing, as you can imagine, you're going into a dealer. It's taking you two hours to get to a dealership. Oh, come on in. Don't worry about all that. We've got you covered. Get yeah. on in here. Cause that's the message. That's what they, that's the message. Get on in here. It doesn't matter. Just get here. Yeah. And then what do they find out? Yeah. They're... We're going to sell own emotion. Well, you got emotion. All right. You got somebody really upset with you right now because <laughs> they don't qualify for yeah. that car. Now what well, are you going to do? You can drive more feet in the store if you're having better conversations than just come on in from that BDC. And also, right, at the BDC, the, the database mining programs uh, that we're integrated with that drive those BDC conversations, right? They're really pulling those data points out and the really good tools really drive those conversations for their BDC reps and tie in and automate those talking points so they can train on them. So when they pop up on the screen for that consumer, they really know, you know, what are the key points that I want to deliver and what are the key points that are going to get this person in the store? And uh, it is so true. I did and this a while ago, but I did mystery shopping because I want to get a feel of how thing, how these reactions uh, to certain technologies. So right. I would go onto a dealership website and I hit the chat and you get that chat. Hey, we're here to help you. And I'm like, great. Okay. <laughs> so I'm shopping for a Honda and I'm just wondering about the interest rate and blah, blah, blah. Do you have any, and all I asked, and it wasn't a big deal. I'm wondering what your subvented interest rates look like. Right. And do you know what I got back? It took her one minute, two minutes, three minutes. And finally, she gets back and she goes, you know what? You have to come into the dealership. Yeah. And I'm like, what? For a subvented interest rate. So that is such a disconnect. And I went from there to another dealer, to another dealer, to another dealer. And it was one thing right after another. I was really surprised because they didn't want to answer that question. It was a simple subvented interest. Sure, we have subvented interest rates. Yeah. You know, what what's wrong with that? And that, that's a little old school uh, mentality that if, if I don't, if I provide a payment or if I provide an interest rate to that consumer, they can shop me very easily with the guy down the street, which is mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. But consumers, guess what? Their expectations now are 
I want to know what my payment is before I come to the store. I want to know, I want you to pull my credit, not just in a pre-qualify and a soft pull, but I want to do my credit application before I come into the store because first, I want to make sure that payment is what it is. And yeah, I might shop you, but I, I want to make sure. And second, I want to spend as little time inside the store as possible. So I want those 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 boxes clicked uh, before I go. And uh, So do you feel like um, Carvana, you know, you have a room out there and you've got CarMax and the focus point from, I mean, I look, I look at CarMax and I've been watching CarMax for years, you know, when, mm -hmm. um, and where they were circuit city and then they went to CarMax and they were competing with AutoNation and they were doing some of the most craziest things. Yeah. But yet those most craziest things certainly are working for them. They have a, a an incredible digital journey mm -hmm. and they don't mess around. They give the customer, you know, you, you tell me how you want to do it. We're going to do it any which way. Right. And look at where they, they are today. Well, they're, they're doing uh, things that dealerships are resistant to do, which is give offers, give payment quotes very easily, provide them very easily online, remotely. Uh, Carvana, um, I, I sold, I recently sold my car to Carvana because I'm, you know, the dealership wouldn't tell me how much they would give towards my deal. And they started giving me some rough estimates and, but I, it was hard to find a dealership that would give me trade in value estimates over the phone. And uh, Carvana was, you know, it's 2000 more than, and, and they showed up at my house. Uh, <laughs> I looked at I mean, my odometer, wrote me a check and he was gone. And <laughs> uh, it's, it's, yeah. A, a frictionless process. That's what consumers uh, gravitate towards uh, as much as possible. That frictionless. Let's, I want to do as much as we can uh, without as, any friction and, and remotely. And uh, I, I want to shop. I want a car shop. That's the advantage of shopping online. So dealers should understand that and, and remove the resistance to provide consumers with the information they need to shop online. I yeah, I just, um, I, it, it's just a tough pill to swallow because they feel like they're, the minute that they do that, we may not, we don't have the control, but what they, and again, I can't help but going back to the days when I first, um, when I was working with the auto nation stores and we were kicking off menu selling in those dealerships and, you know, Ken, it was, it was a very intimidating time in my life. No, but I, hey, I was doing AEP before that. I was back in, you know, working in Baltimore doing payment packing like it was no tomorrow. And now all of a sudden you want me to be completely upfront. Here I am. Customers understand all the terms of the sale. I'm out, out of my office. There's no closing, you know, closing them in the box, ball and chain mentality. Here we are. And I'm thinking, how is this going to work? everything laid out for the customer mm -hmm. and it took me about 30 days to figure it out but talk about resistance right yeah. from dealerships all over the country this woman's out of her mind she's drinking some sort of kind of kool-aid <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's no i doubt it it's it's going to cost us profit so it's yeah. a matter of really understanding the concept behind being a front just give control to get control yeah um, one of one of to me one of the surprising things to come out of about this uh, move to digital retailing apps online is that they're having more success selling F and I uh, menu products than and they're increasing sales for dealerships and F and I the good tools and they're doing so well that that pushes that digital retailing app. So now it's being used in the front of the store because if I can get all my apps going through this and drive all my F and I sales. So for those dealers out there that are shopping for digital retailing uh, products, you know, look at the F and I and uh, look long-term to move it to the front of the store, that digital retailing experience. Those are, that's a key, key indicator that you, you've selected a good tool. Yeah, so. Well, that's one of the things that we were talking through as well. You know, we do have some DR um, and providers coming on and everyone has a which way of their own philosophy of how yeah. things get done. 
And, you know, in closing, I got to tell you, right, when I do training and I've been all over the country doing training, right, workshops and in dealership. And I'm like, you tell me, you know, let's make sure that my training and what's taking place in your dealership, we're in alignment because you're spent, you're spending three to five days with me. And yeah. if you get back to your dealership and we're not in alignment and that sales manager is saying, I don't know about this interview, meeting customers at the salesperson's desk, but we've got a deal and you got to go take it. So yeah. it's got to be in alignment. So that process, that technology, because it leverages what's going on in your dealership, it's supposed to support it so yeah. that you just go really just go hand in hand, like you said. Yeah. So in closing, Ken, thank you again for being on the F&I Master Series Forum, The Digital Age, and thanks 700 Credit for sponsoring. Really appreciate that. Thank, thank you, uh, and what a great forum for dealer education, and that's what we're looking for, to educate dealers on these products and services. So uh, for, thank you. And thank you, 700 Credit. You're awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you again. Thanks. Well, Frank McKenna, I am so happy that you're here with us or with me today in, um, on our F&I Master Series Forum. And so again, the digital age. So let's, for dealers and viewers, let's talk about this fraud and what's, what's going on about it and the impacted, um, impact it causes in our dealerships. Yeah, you know, Becky, um, again, delighted to be here with you today talking about fraud. You know, fraud right now is probably at its highest level in history here in the United States. Um, here at Point Predicted, we estimate last year about $7.7 .7 billion in fraud impact to the auto lending industry. And dealers are really being um, impacted by fraud more than ever. And there's really quite a few different schemes and, and scams that are going on that uh, I'll talk about in a minute. But if you look at dealerships, what we're hearing in the industry, what we're hearing from lenders is that dealerships are being impacted by a lot of identity theft, by a lot of use of synthetic identities, and by a lot of fraud rings that are going state to state that are defrauding dealers in certain areas and they're moving to another state. So we're seeing a lot of this transient behavior where people are going into different areas where dealers may not be aware of fraud, and so they're being attacked by it. So. Fraud is a real serious concern right now for dealerships across the country. Well, um, so what are dealers doing to at least identify those um, those um, events? And yeah. there's several, right? So what are they doing to protect themselves? Yeah. So let me tell you what I'm seeing, like the key. There's four types of fraud right now that I think dealers need to be aware of, and I'll tell you what, what some of them are doing. Um, I don't think most dealerships are doing nearly enough for fraud just because they're used to maybe how fraud used to be, where it wasn't as prevalent as now. But the four types of fraud that I'm seeing out there that are really hurting dealerships are people committing identity theft. So identity theft is up to its highest level. Last year, here in the United States, about $56 billion in identity theft. It doubled last year. So people are going into dealerships with stolen identities and purchasing these cars. Sometimes they're not even going into dealerships, they're doing it remotely. So remote identity theft or remote delivery, I should call it, is a, is a big trend. Synthetic identity. So people using stolen social security numbers and creating a brand new identity. That's another type of fraud. And then there's the old types of fraud that have been around for a long time which is people lying about their income and people using fake employers. They're using those fake employers and those fake pay stubs to qualify for loans. So what dealerships that I find, most of them, what they're doing today, mm -hmm. is a lot of um, kind of 
red flag checking, but it's primarily just on the identity, right? Using those red flag checks that sure. come from the credit bureaus. <laughs> right. And that's, that's some of the things that they're doing. And is that helpful? I mean, are we getting enough information from this red flag polls that I know that we do the OFAC, et cetera, and then maybe sometimes it's the out of wallet questions, but is that enough? I mean, to, to, to really wrap our heads around this, to assure that that person is who they say that they are. Not anymore. It maybe it was at one point, but those red flags checks just simply don't go far enough. Um, I think dealerships need to do some really tangible things to that go beyond red flag checking. Um, they need to look at those pay stubs that they're getting from borrowers and look at them and make sure they look okay. When they get that pay stub, they need to go in and look at the employer that's being passed through on that pay stub and Google search it, right? They need to get, go beyond because anytime you have a fraud, whether it's an identity theft or a synthetic identity or income, there's always going to be a fake employer and the income, the employer may not even exist. So they need to kind of do things like that. They need to get the driver's licenses, right? They need mm. to get selfies. There's fingerprints. They need to go above and beyond red flag checks because those just aren't enough anymore. Well, I, I know that some dealers have a certain process that they, they have put in place to make sure that our sales associates are validating that driver's license. And it certainly helps to match that up with the customer that's purchasing the vehicle and, Absolutely. and doing their due diligence there. One of the other things that um, come to mind, I remember on a LinkedIn post, um, well, actually I might even put it put the post out there um, with regard to there's 5,000 or founded 5,000 oh. Yeah. Um, fake employers. Can yeah. you kind of talk a little bit through that? What, what is, what's going on there? Yeah, this was absolutely incredible. So here we have our own fraud investigation team. We've got four fraud investigators and we're processing about 2 million applications through our scoring system each and every month. Our investigators are going through those loans on behalf of lenders and we're looking for fraud patterns. And one of the big patterns that we saw last year was the use of fake employers. And what a fake employer is, it's a website that's been created oftentimes by like a credit repair company. Some of these credit repair companies will create these employment websites that they'll sell to consumers. And what they'll do is they'll give them the website, they'll give them a fake pay stub, and there'll be an 800 number on that website that if a dealer calls or a lender calls, a person will answer the phone and say, Oh yes, you know John Smith works here, and John Smith makes one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year as a manager. It's all fake, right? It's just they're put in place to defraud lenders and dealers. And we found five thousand of these. We're finding about a hundred new ones every week. And there's about a billion dollars that we found in the last eighteen months of loans that are coming from these fake employers that dealers are taking in, and and lenders are taking in as well. That's a so huge trend. So my question there, and I, I think some of our dealers or their, their personnel team will wonder, well, what's that got to do with us? Mm -hmm. And okay, well, we've done our due diligence. We can't help that that person, you know, their, their employee set or verified this POI. How is that? Does that come back on the dealer? Yeah. You know, that's, that's a good counterpoint, but it, unfortunately, these fake employers are also tied to identity theft. They're also tied to synthetic identity because they're using these also in those types of schemes. And these loans are often defaulting right away. They're not making any payments. So you, you know, the, a lot of dealerships are on the hook if that loan makes no payments, right? The lender can push it back to them. They're also on the hook if it's an identity theft. So yeah. if I think ignoring, it's you know, important to point that out. Yeah, the pushback, the risk and about from our surveys, about 75 percent of lenders push back loans mm -hmm. if they find a synthetic identity or identity theft or a, a non-payment. So you think, oh, the POI is not my responsibility, but it will be. It will become because if it's part of any of those, if it's first payment default or identity theft or synthetic, you will get a pushback. And that'll be a big loss to the to to the dealership. 
Yeah, I hope that they um, understand and read their uh, dealer agreements and how important that is, because I think a lot of a lot of these guys um, maybe not, haven't picked that dealer agreement up in a while and understood the cost of doing business and making sure that they're validating this information as much as they possibly can. Now, there are other, I guess, fraud um, type prevention tools, te technology, where, you know, you talk, um, the IRS is kind of utilizing this way of scanning the uh, customer's ID for validation. Can you walk us through that a, a bit yeah. and explain how that works? Yeah. So this technology has been super effective and there's a few companies that offer it. And what it does is it's a, it's a multi-step process where a consumer, let's say they're buying a car. Or you mentioned the IRS. We can use that as an example as well. It's also used in unemployment agencies. Let's use it by about 50, almost half the states use this technology now and super effective. And what it involves is a consumer taking a picture of their driver's license front and back. Then it involves them taking a selfie or sometimes a video um, in the case of the IRS, I believe. And what the technology is doing is that's getting uploaded. It's scanning the driver's license. It's going against like the state databases. It's looking at the driver's license, picking out any anomalies and saying this driver's license is genuine or it's counterfeit. And then it's taking the selfie and it's matching it up to the driver's license picture to say, does it approximately match the driver's license picture? So it's doing all of this. It's doing it in less than a minute and it's flagging fair fraudulent identities uh, at a very high accuracy rate. It's super effective. It's much better than looking at a driver's license and trying to figure out if it's valid or not. And I think it's, really going to be a great tool for dealerships as soon as it kind of makes its way into the processes. But I, I think it's absolutely terrific way to stop fraud um, on that driver's license. Now, you also mentioned, I'm going to go back a little bit on the uh, verification uh, proof of income. Yeah. Now, from my perspective, and I've been in de dealerships all over the U USA and and so I know sometimes we take it at face value, this POI, don't think twice about it, and then just keep on keeping on and um, keeping our fingers crossed that everything works out. Right. What are there any services that a dealer can utilize to actually get verified POI? I know like of one, maybe TurboPass, Mm -hmm. um, where they do some um, verification through the customer's banking, Absolutely. bank statements, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about what that's all about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Terrific solution. TurboPass um, was launched a couple of years ago. They have a lot of dealerships using this now. And what it does is it basically allows the consumer to provide a consent to scan their bank statements in. So typically how it works is okay. a link will be sent to the consumer's cell, cell phone. They'll click on that link. They'll type in their credentials for their bank. And then the lender or the dealership gets a uh, PDF copy, three months of bank statements that goes to their portal. They can log in and they can actually look at the bank statements. They can then kind of compare what comes through on the pay stubs with what's showing up in the bank statements. So TurboPass enables that and it lets you kind of validate that the income is actually appearing in the bank statement, right? There should be a de uh, de you know, direct deposit that they can match up against. It also helps them, the dealership, see if the identity on the bank account matches the identity of the person presenting the identification. So there's tons of great use cases for products like that, like TurboPass is a great example that can work really well in verifying income. So I also understand that some of the lenders, and they might have some connectivity, I'm not exactly sure of the terms with this, so help me out with that, but they have connectivity with Route 1, where they can utilize TurboPass for verification of that income. i not 100% how all that comes together. Maybe you can help me out. Maybe dealer-centric as well for independent dealers. I think that's the strategy. So I think it's uh, they have um, integrations into like loan origination type platforms like Route One and some others. 
And it basically enables the lenders and the dealer to kind of share, was, this is the way I understand it, share okay. that bank statement. So when the borrower fills it out or does the consent, that both the lender and the dealer can validate the income off of those bank statements. So it's kind of clever because it's kind of, I think it's a multi-case where everybody can kind of share that document and, and verify that the income's valid. What I think I liked about it, the whole idea behind it, is that we have lenders that are on it that um, will utilize TurboPass. Now, it's good for the dealer because I'd want to know that the person that I'm doing business with is who they say that they are, it, yeah. you know, from the very beginning. You know, why not? Why not figure out the income and verify that earlier on rather than waiting until that deal makes its way into F&I and then we find out we don't have a deal? I don't quite... Right that madness and but it continues to happen i don't know why you'd want to do that but the benefit behind turbo is past is that we know firsthand who we're dealing with and second the income is likely verifiable that's right yeah and we're doing a lot of ourselves we're doing a lot uh here at point predictive around income as well to help dealerships because we think oh, being able to tap into like what we have is prior income reports. You know, we see millions of consumers every month reporting loans in. And mm -hmm. what we're able, what we're going to launch probably in the next year is the ability for a dealership to kind of get an income history to see mm -hmm. if this borrower's income is is consistent with what we've seen at other lenders. That's what we great. see in our data, we see about 20% of consumers going to dealerships misrepresenting their income by a lot. So we see it, we'll see one loan come in from lender A through dealership A, mm -hmm. and they're set, the borrower's saying they make 40,000. And then the next day, we're seeing the consumer go to dealer B, lender B, and saying they make 100,000. So we wanna give that kind of flag to dealerships to say, hey, this is totally not consistent with what the borrowers provided before. So those consistency type checks are something that we're working on to provide around verification of income as well. Those can be simple things, right? That give a dealer a flag to say, Hey, hold on. You need to go take additional steps on this income. Well, I think that the dealers do, I mean, should, I mean, how many times does something not the POI doesn't check out and, and that deal sits on CIT list forever long in the day. And there are times that, you know, we can't get that income to prove out. And so, you know, we got to bring vehicles back and it, it's, yeah. you know, it's not the best experience for anyone. Not a good experience. Income is notoriously <laughs> hard. About tw another interesting stat is about dealer uh, lenders find that about those pay stubs that they're getting in. Maybe dealers aren't finding it, but some lenders are finding that one in five of those pay stubs that are coming through the dealerships are forged. So dealers aren't even, be able, aren't detecting it, but lenders, because they're have more experts like fraud experts are able to find those forgeries. So that's why you need these additional outside checks beyond the pay stub because they're out there. There's a ton of forged pay stubs right now um, that are being passed to dealerships. So this is what I'm hearing. Okay. So now we've got digital retailing, right? And now everybody and their mother's talking about digital retailing. Let's just make it easier for the customer to go ahead and buy a car, toggle through some of these terms and, you know, sure. even complete the financing. Um, depending right. on which um, company or platform provider or DR tool that you're utilizing. But at the end of the day, you know, we still have dealers that are going, well, wait a second here. You know, I'm, I'm a, how are we protecting ourselves to make sure that that customer is mm -hmm. who they say that they are? And, you know, what are you recommending? What are the steps that you're recommending for dealers to protect themselves when it comes to this remote delivery and that yeah. and speak on the the dr piece too while you're at it yeah so um let me uh let me tell you what the police recommend um sergeant oh, wow. Aaron Foster with the houston police department mm -hmm. um, he does he trains hundreds of dealers and he he has stopped millions in fraud um by training dealers and doing a fraud in progress program and he is very focused right now on remote delivery because it's the hottest fraud trend out there right now. Um, so this is what, what he recommends. Okay. Um, number one, don't make remote delivery so easy. Um, remote delivery 
if it doesn't make sense, if it's not a luxury car, or it's not a specialized car that, you know, and the person lives, claims to live in the city, why can't they just go to the dealership? You know, why do you have to go to a Walmart parking lot and drop the car off for them? The common sense stuff, remote delivery shouldn't apply in all cases. It should not be that easy. Secondly is, and we talked about a little bit about this, Becky, is yeah. get a selfie of the borrower when the ID is being presented. Make the borrower give you a picture of the driver's license and a selfie. So you don't want to ever just trust a driver's license picture that you get because it could be completely forged. So getting a selfie doesn't prove that the license is fraudulent, but it proves that there's a person behind the transaction, a real person, and that the picture is going to match. Because a lot of times what on remote delivery, what these fraud rings are doing is they're creating digital images of driver's license. Mm -hmm. And they're passing those through. They're not even a physical copy. So when you get a, a selfie and a picture of the driver's license, that you'll know that there's actually a human behind it. So that's the second thing. Always get that selfie and that driver's license. Make sure the person you're dealing with is not a mule, right? Because when you go to drop off the car, a lot of times these fraud rings, they don't want to get arrested. So they use a sacrificial suspect. They'll use somebody that they've gotten off the street that'll go just pick up the car and get it. So make sure when you go, match that picture and that driver's license that you got at the dealership when it was remote delivery and see, does it match the person you're giving the car to? So if in the event, and I don't mean to cut you yeah. off, well, yeah. let's think through this a bit yeah. because we have drivers yeah. who are taking the vehicles and I'm assuming dropping the vehicle off at whatever location, yeah. it would stand to reason that I'm meeting a customer in a Walmart shopping center and I'm going to, I'm going to be okay with that. Right. It makes no sense. <laughs> I, it doesn't make any sense. Why would I do that? You shouldn't. <laughs> right. Just like, go to the dealership. <laughs> Let them come to the dealership. If I mean, a Walmart, Walmart shopping center, just come to the Walmart shopping center and I'm going to have a driver draw. I just see Don Brady, you know, he just, you know, I don't know if you've seen his post, but I just see he's everywhere. And so I just can't imagine him. Okay, we're just going to drop this car off in Walmart shopping center. And so, do it. okay. <laughs> okay. So now we have remote, we have the ability to do remote signing or e or e contracting through remote. What are, what are your thoughts about that? Because dealers are not very comfortable with that either. They much rather the documents print them out like they've always have, mm -hmm. and then FedEx them. I guess where you have to have them notarized in front of mm -hmm. another party. Right. Is that happening? Is that happening where there's forgery with um. e signing? Yes. Yeah. Or, you know, to me, I would think it, yeah. How, what would you recommend? What is your recommendation on this e-remote signing capability? It is available, but should dealers do that? Should they continue to stay with printing the documents and overnighting those documents? And I assume yeah. they're being sent to the customer's home and the whole idea, I guess, is to deliver the vehicle to, see, I was thinking the individual's driveway, but not a Walmart shopping center. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I have not heard, doesn't mean it's not happening. I just haven't heard of fraud with the remote signing. I have heard of remote delivery fraud. Um, and that... What they'll typically do is last minute, they'll change the address like because they want to throw the person off. So they may say, oh, I'm going to get it at my home. And then they switch it to Walmart uh, because they don't want the police to get involved. Right. So I've heard of that. Um, I don't know. You know, it's always good to throw roadblocks in front of fraudsters and make it harder. I haven't heard of problems with the remote signing. But when you do those, you need to when you drop off the vehicle, you need to do a lot of steps. Right. To verify that. The person that's done all that signing is actually a legitimate person and the person that owns that identity. Okay. So it makes sense. So here's what I'm hearing you say. We can do the e-remote signing. Mm -hmm. 
we can go e-contracting, we can yeah. do the e-remote, get upload the do dealer documents and the customer yeah. can sign however, which way there's a lot of different ways to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and, but when we go to deliver the vehicle, let's take the extra step as well okay. to continue to identify that that person is who they say that they are. That's exactly right, Becky. That's exactly right. You can do all these electronic things at that point of transfer of the vehicle. Let's go through some extra steps. You know, the selfies. Um, the other good one I, I like to say is, and the, the police recommend as well, take a picture. When you get there, if the person's wearing a mask, this happened a lot last year, make them take down the mask compared to the driver's license. Take a picture of the driver's license you get and take a picture of the person and take a picture of the person in front of the car. Get all those pictures and keep them because if it is fraud, the police can use that later to identify the person. So things like that, you can take extra measures. It only takes a few minutes, right, to mm -hmm. do all this, but you're going to save yourself a huge headache if it's fraud. Well, okay. So I guess the other question is I made the decision I did as a dealer to deliver this vehicle to whatever location. Mm -hmm. I dropped that vehicle off. I thought I did my due diligence and had customers signing the correct documents for delivery, however, which way. Mm -hmm. Customer turns out, he drives, they, they take the car. Next thing you know, the guy, the guy, it was a fraud. Yeah. Now, can a dealer at that point put a get a hook you know they they say get get a hook on that car and and get it and bring it back to the dealership what are what is the what's the dealer allowed to do in this in this type of situation uh, this type of situation so they found out that it's fraud is what right. you're saying yeah let's just say we delivered we did we did yep and come to find out that person wasn't who they say that they were yep you can um you try to do the easy thing, which is calling the person, if you can reach them and tell them to bring the car back and bring in documentation. You know, sometimes if it's a synthetic identity and it's a real person, they may come back and bring the car. You can try that. It won't work very often, but it could. If you can't reach them, uh, you can call and report a, you can file a police report for a stolen car, right? If you, uh, if you know that it's a, a fraudulent identity, that's a stolen car. So you can file a police report. At that point, um, you can, like you said, with if there's tracking on the car, you can go try to re retrieve that car. Um, the thing is, you want to have. That's why it's important to have the documentation that you've gotten. You know, the pictures of the selfies and all those things. And even you know, the police recommend when you get there, do a form where you can get a fingerprint, right, of the person that you're giving the car to. So to have them sign something, I'm like taking delivery of the vehicle and put their fingerprint on there. So when you file that police report, they're gonna police are gonna have those pictures. They're gonna have that thumbprint. They're gonna be able to track it back to who probably took stole that car, mm -hmm. and they're gonna be able to help you, um, you know, apprehend that person and hopefully get that car back before it's shipped off overseas. So somewhere. the dealer can't go out to go get the vehicle. So what you're saying is because many times they'll go. I, I've seen it time and time again they have their resources to be able to figure out where maybe this vehicle might be. And they go put a hook out on it and get it back into the dealership. Yeah. Are they allowed to do that? That's a good question. I, I assume so, but again, I'm not a, um, that would be a question for law enforcement. I don't see why they couldn't, if it's a fraudulent identity that they're using, right. Uh -huh. They determined it. So they should be able to, okay. Um, yeah. But I would follow, definitely follow a police report because they may, you don't know what kind of person you're dealing with. These fraudsters some are pretty dangerous sometimes. So you might be yeah. putting yourself in a, in a questionable situation. Well, I've seen a lot of these guys do some, some um, off the wall, make some interesting decisions and, and they put themselves at risk to uh, do whatever they can to get this vehicle back. So in closing, um, what, what are you, what are you sharing with, dealers to, you know, again, do everything that they can to assure that that individual is who that they are doing business with. And again, how to shore it up to make sure that 
yeah. they get it right the first time out. Yeah. Number, you know, they'll just quickly go through. Trust your gut. If a deal doesn't make sense, trust your gut and take those extra measures. Work those red flags report. Make sure you're crossing your I's and T's. Get that driver's license, that selfie. When you deliver that vehicle or the person comes in, make sure that you take pictures, get the fingerprints, all your documentation set up. Um, don't just trust those pay stubs. You know, do some additional things like, you know, the Turbo Pass, a great example. All those are great ways that dealers can limit their risk in such a high fraud environment. So those would be my main recommendations for dealerships today. Okay, well, thank you. How can our dealers and viewers reach out to you? Yeah, they uh, can reach out to the company info at Point Predictive. So mm -hmm. info at pointpredictive.com. They can also reach out to me directly. I'm happy. I talk to people across the industry all the time about fraud. Um, F McKenna, that's my first name, F McKenna at pointpredictive.com. Um, I also have a blog called Frank on Fraud. has lots of tips on how to find fraud and lots of fraud trends. So there are various ways people can reach out and and, and get help on fraud if they, if they need anything. I'm happy to talk to anybody. I know that you go out of your way to post some great articles, great information on LinkedIn. I think everybody needs to figure out how to find you on LinkedIn as well, Frank, because yeah. um, I'm, I'm always capturing some good information on your post and articles. So thank you, Becky. I do appreciate all the support. You've always been such a huge advocate of fraud controls at dealerships. And I always appreciate, appreciate you giving me like a platform to kind of get the word out there. It's, it's super important. And I know you've always believed that and I, I definitely appreciate it. Well, thank you again. And um, I'm glad you were able to um, be on our F&I Master Series Forum, the digital age. So yeah. thank you again. Thank I you, appreciate Beck. it. All right. Stephen Apicella, it is certainly a pleasure to bring you on our first, but not last, F&I Master Series of Forum, the Digital Age, and a welcome. So for our dealers and viewers, if, we, if you would, let's talk about this digital life cycle that you seem to want to share a lot in our social media groups. Thanks, Becky, and awesome to be here and part of it. And on the first one, I'm, I'm honored. Um, you know, digital life cycle is something that redefines dealer customer engagement beyond the one-time transaction. So one thing I rhetorically ask in the industry, is it our mission, our industry's mission to only sell a car, or also earn a reoccurring customer? Now, obviously the latter is true or desired, but that's not what our industry is earning. So if we look at, you know, the even the, the processes that are in place like digital retailing, which I think is an important contribution, an important advancement, we don't do it, but I support it, is the associated digital experience that comes with digital retailing abruptly ends before the point of sale. And the question is, is that where the frictionless desired dealer customer engagement should end or just begin? So digital life cycle is tearing a page out of companies like Amazon, where Amazon is a trillion dollar valued company and something that all generations engage in doesn't exist because of the one time digital transaction. Amazon is Amazon or retailing Titan because they solve the desired customer engagement before and after the sale that keeps their customers coming back again and again and again and again organically. Mm -hmm. Today, they're not the cheapest resource online, but because customers appreciate and like to engage both before and after the sale, um, they come back irregardless. And if you were to really think about it, it's profound as a trillion dollar company, for them or for Apple, remove the reoccurring customer and what's left. 
not the Amazon we know. Right. So the same thing for the auto retailing industry. Um, the statistics are sobering that um, we're really good at selling cars, whether we have inventory or not, but we're not good at retaining customers. And the value of the returning customer is immense. Um, yeah. But why does that happen the way it happens? And for most car buyers today that dislike the car buying process, when they pull off the lot with their car, the transaction and therefore the relationship is over. And if we're really going to elevate the auto retailing industry, even beyond the 100% online retailer, we have to leverage the very essence that differentiates the brick and mortar dealer, which is their unique ability to also locally service their customer better than anybody. Mm -hmm. but right now, that's really been lost. And so as we look at that, and there, there's, there's other points to it. F&I, which you're an expert at, um, F&I is a one micro moment event. And that's yeah, I, I really want to hit get into that a bit more when you talk about this micro moment when we're presenting our menu. So what else should be going on here? Well, if you think about it, so a customer, you know, again, the way they perceive it is a customer goes through a three or four hour slug fest to buy a car. And then they find somebody really nice and pleasant and intelligent like you in an F&I environment. And then you show them for the first time five or six different products that they've never heard of before. And then in that moment, they must make a decision. And, you know, in that moment, there's time constraints, there's funding constraints, there's fatigue constraints. There's I can't make a decision right now constraints where if F&I is so valuable, it's valuable for two reasons. The obvious one is the revenue. Uh, it's a critical financial work center for every dealer. That's right. But there's also a customer ownership benefit and a retention benefit that comes with F&I products too, if they're done correctly. So we wanna get these products in as many customers' hands as possible so that we both get the revenue and the retention benefits and the customer gets the ownership value uh, benefit out of it. But right now, if the industry sells an average of 1.6, let's round up and play devil's advocate, two products per sale, mm -hmm. then what happens to the other three or four or five products? Right now, today, they're gone forever. Uh, there is no, typically, no second swing at the plate. And when there is a second swing at the plate, there are, and again, I won't name names and I don't desire to tear down companies to build ourselves up, but those attempts are hiring an outside company to scrape data and to do a spam campaign with phone solicitations and junk mail to really threaten a customer that if they don't get these service contracts or warranties, they'll certainly face financial peril. And I don't think that's the way our industry grows. And I don't think that's how we build trust. And, and I don't know how that, how many people actually pick up the phone anymore. <laughs> it's crazy, you know? So, and so the whole digital life cycle thing is pretty simple in concept. Everybody knows that business is built on relationships. We're all taught that because it's true, but good longstanding relationships require good, relevant communication. So as we've talked about before is, you know, again, it's, it's really simple. Business relationships are not unlike personal relationships. Stop communicating to a significant other or a friend or a business colleague or a customer. And very quickly, the relationship falls apart. Right. And right now, again, I have personal examples of purchasing vehicles and never hearing from the car dealer thereafter. So as dealerships are very firm on their why buy here proposition, everybody has one, but very few contemplate why return here. What, what's in it after the transaction and how do we communicate and how does that relationship prevail over all the other options and all the other noise where a customer can go and have their car serviced and engaged. So the digital life cycle is to address that head on and say that the end of, or the, the cu customer buying a vehicle is not the end, it's just the beginning. And, and putting into the customer's hands a very valuable tool right on their smartphone 
It allows the dealership to communicate to them, allows the dealership to incentivize their loyalty, allows the customer to engage their valuable F&I products and learn and understand the products that they didn't buy. And God forbid in 2022, let them engage and buy those missed products on their smartphone after the point of sale. Well, I for, I think that's pretty darn smart to be able to put that back in the customer's hands um, as a as a follow up to be able to take advantage of those products that they didn't take advantage of at time of delivery. And I can I agree with you. I mean, how many times has the customer said no, and maybe they just had way too much information coming at them at all at one time, so it's just easier for them to back up and say, you know what. I'm not interested in the products. Thanks anyway. But as a, you, you know, mentioned, we, we, do a, we do a digital survey, Becky, of one question after every person that buys a contract digitally in our platform. Remember, we're not a third party administrator. We're just facilitating the relationship. You use what third party administrators you want to use um, in the finance environment and in post sales. Right. We're not we're not dictating that. That's the dealer's choice on what they want to do. And there's definitely F&I leaders out there that are part of this that are making their vote to empower the dealer and the customer to engage more in a more modern way. But if you take a look at there's so many pieces of the puzzle, we ask ourselves, why does this occur? And is it good enough the way it is, right? The industry is really good at refining existing processes. We're pretty good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not good about filling in the gaps and creating the processes that fill the vacancies that have been there forever. Um, if we really desire the reoccurring customer after the point of sale, take a look at like what I said earlier about F&I products. There's supposed to be, among other things, a retention benefit. That's right. When a customer comes into a service drive, um, this should be a golden moment. You know, the customer organically came back. They never read their service contract. They never read their warranty, but they knew when they needed help and they thought they had some kind of protection, they, they naturally come back to the dealer. And then that transaction falls apart between the dealer and the service advisor because the industry does not do a good job at equipping the service advisor with the tools to properly engage when service is needed with these F&I products. Imagine a customer coming in to a dealership and saying, hey, I bought my car here. I bought some protection products. I need service support. And the service advisor today says, what products did you buy from us? <laughs> Do you have a copy of your warranty with you? Do you know what it's called? Do you know your okay. agreement number? And the customer's uh, thinking, wait a minute. I bought this crap from you. Don't you know? Do you know how many times that happens and how frustrating it is? And then they the tear customer, out of that service the department to the F&I advisor. department? Yeah, it's equally frustrating for the service advisor because our industry puts them in a terrible spot. Um, so we ask ourselves, is, is that okay? Is that interaction okay that spoils what should be a golden retention moment? No, it's not. It, is it okay for a third-party administrator to provide service with, again, these are service contracts. Most simplest definition is contract for service. That's right. When service is required, is in 2022, is a 1-800 number and a phone queue and call hold wait times and manual claim processing as the primary service mechanism okay? I don't believe so. Or is an online claim form where you fill in all the blanks and it leads to a phone call anyway? Or an app, even if somebody takes it a step further and they create an app, that app only works with one provider when a That's dealer right. is navigating multiple providers, is any of that okay? No. And it's not. I don't think so. And that's where, again, the value of these products, in order to earn the revenue and in order to earn the retention, we have to have processes in place that make these products frictionless and valuable to both the dealer and the customer. So what if the customer comes back in that same environment, says, hey, I bought my car here and some protection products that need service support. And the service advisor says, no problem, let me scan your VIN barcode and let's get you taken care of. That's, that's again, the, the, the mantra of connect the disconnected. All the pieces are there. There's a third party administrator providing a valuable asset to the dealer. There's a service advisor that wants to help and there's a customer that wants to engage. 
but we're missing the link in between them. And the same thing about pre-sales to sales to post-sales. If this is a disconnected from reality journey, that's why customers are not returning to their dealers is because that's what's earned. We're missing processes to keep that customer organically connected throughout their ownership journey. And the pathway to not, that is not phone solicitations. And it's not junk mail, postal or email. It's not random text messages. It's on these devices that were created in 2007. Isn't it time for our industry to start leveraging them? Because as we talk about smart devices and commonality, is a smartphone exclusive to a millennial or a Gen Z? Or is it everybody on the planet these days? That's right? Right. These things are so valuable to us that yours is probably sitting in front of you right now. We don't just keep them close. They're right in front of us, right? How did you, and, how did you know that? <laughs> But these are a great communication tool that should be leveraged better. And we can't expect customers to jump through rings of fire. We can't expect them to navigate non-desirable pathways. And we can't expect them to adopt seven different solutions. We have to provide one unified frictionless solution that keeps that customer organically coming back again and again and again. It's the very essence that separates today's brick and mortar dealerships from the 100% online retailers, which for now, today, are just selling cars. That's right. Well, is that what we're doing too? Or are we really trying to earn a reoccurring customer? And the fact is actions and processes speak louder than words if we're going to achieve that. So through this means, is there, what accountability? Is there anyone behind this that is really managing how this all com is coming together for? You know, dealers? our experience has been as part of this innovation stack that we've grown called Your Dealer Experience is when you give a dealership a modern, relevant mechanism to stay connected to their customer and to be able to engage the customer in a way in which they receive and to be able to extend the runway of F&I revenue and to improve the engagement of F&I products and the what leads to service through these moments, these moments that happen that we either succeed or fail. When you give a dealer a tool that possesses that strength to provide digital life cycle beyond digital retailing, they immediately take ownership of it. They want to get that application in the hands of every customer, whether it's an Apple phone or an Android phone, uh, a dealer branded app that allows that customer to organically stay connected with their dealer. And the, the dealers respond. But again, it's be the reason why it doesn't exist right now is the process is missing. That's it's right. totally vacant. So when a customer leaves a dealership, and again, you've heard me say this phrase, I say it often, then what? You acquired a customer digitally, then what? You sold the customer a car, then what? What happens next if you desire the reoccurring customer? And when dealers tell me we send our customer an oil change coupon, or we send them a postcard in the mail on their birthday, that's not it. And again, the reason why customers aren't coming back is because that's what's earned. We have to do better than that. When a dealership community, and again, Becky, I, I always marvel at this topic. When I show dealers the pathway to digital engagement, digital life cycle, and the pathway to something like push notifications and stylized messaging that can really make a connection that feels organic to the customer on their smartphone, I'll say, what should be the first message you should send a customer after you sell them a car? Overwhelmingly, I hear like an oil change special because they, they want to get the customer back in for that first visit. I was going to say say it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> and, and, and what I say is what I think people expect is, thanks for buying a car from us. That's right. We know you had a choice. Thanks for trusting us. Welcome to the family. We're looking forward to being on this journey with you to put a stake in the ground that tells that customer selling you the vehicle was not the end of the journey. It's just the beginning. And then the next message, again, you're not selling anything, you're creating a relationship through communication. The next thing could be the service director that introduces that customer at the appropriate time 
to their service drive to show that customer how that dealer can uniquely support them on their ownership journey better than anybody. Or it could be a service drive special, or it could be um, a community event that the dealer wants the customer to participate in so we can build a relationship together. It could be information about their vehicle. How many times have we driven a car for three years and realized we had a feature that we never learned about during our whole ownership? I had one car, I turned back on a lease, and on the day I returned it back, I found a little button on the back that was a heated steering wheel, and I didn't even know it was there <laughs> on the back of the steering wheel. Um, it could be educational things like that, but that kind of interaction is what builds relationships. And it's not just, again, you know, I want people to celebrate my birthday, but not necessarily my dealer. You know, that's not really, that doesn't inspire a relationship to me. Right. Right. Um, what inspires a relationship is, are you adding value to my life and to my ownership experience? And are you speaking to me in a way in which I appreciate receiving? And when you do those two very elementary things, you then have an opportunity to really earn the reoccurring customer. And again, I, you know, I understand it's about revenue. I understand it's about making money. But we can do that through the experience that we deliver to our customers in 2022 and beyond. And the challenge for anybody watching this, whether they're part of the support community or a dealer, is, and this should be sobering, if you're not delivering it, somebody else will. And that's where our industry is at right now. We can't just put our head in the sand and say it's okay or it's good enough. It's not good enough. When most customers say they don't like the car buying process, and most customers don't return after the sale, there's some work to be done. And we have to embrace that as a community and work together to the desired result. We're a piece of the puzzle, Becky. We're not everything, right? But what we're doing is filling a very critically missing vacancy. How do you see this F&I manager in your, in your process as this plays out? How does you know, that whole yeah, thing work? What I love about what we do, you know, so the way that the, the process works is when a dealership through our app, let's say, gets another 37 service contracts or warranty in a calendar month for one rooftop. Um, that business is just added to their existing business and it goes through the same remittance process and everything they just get credit for 37 more service contracts or warranties so you're saying it's going through your app it's automated yep. and customers at at whatever time they're notified or have through, access through self to it? through self-discovery which is here's all your service contracts and warranties and by very natural extension here's everything you didn't buy customers can see that right on their smartphone Right, they can also engage on their smartphone with the products they purchase. So things like, um, how many customers ever read their service contract or warranty ever? Well, very, very few. Right? I and great. I think so. Let's face it. Sometimes a dealer will have our higher mileage service contract provider that's outside of the reinsurance program. Right. How many times does that happen, time and time again, or any other ancillary products for that much matter? So, you know, the simple question, should a customer or a service advisor on behalf of the customer be able to see their contract details and the definition of their products on their smartphone in 2022? Sure. Of course, but that's not the way it is. No, that's true. Today, right? That's right. That's right. Um, should they be able to engage in service from it on their smartphone? Of course, but that's not the way it is. Should they be able to buy additional service contracts or warranties on their smartphone and even be able to finance them on their smartphone? Of course they should. Should a dealer be able to communicate those notifications, right? One of the notifications can be, because again, we allow the dealer to decide, does this go to everybody? Does this go to a group of people? Is it just people that bought Camrys last month? Who's the message going to all the way down to a single person? What if you received a message with a push notification, a stylized message that says, did you know you can enhance your ownership experience with these valuable products. Click here to learn more. Uh, you know, at, at any time that you can put this information in front of the customer and we're automating that experience, I can't imagine that it just wouldn't be better overall. 
let alone by when the customer gets into our service departments to determine to make sure that that VIN number is matching to all the products or that that customer has taken advantage of. And there's not a service writer coming back and telling the customer they don't have a service contract or whatever other product that the customer thought that they had taken advantage of. I mean, th just to eliminate that alone is priceless. I would you know, think. You know, and I think leaders like you and others, Becky, here's the deal. Um, pushing the envelope to things that are valuable to both the dealer and the customer when the dealer stays the same over years and decades, and the customer didn't just change because of the pandemic, the customer's always changing a little bit at a time, always evolving. Well, eventually over time, as they are creeping up and the dealer is staying the same, all of a sudden you got this massive disconnected from reality gap. That's where we're at today. And there's really, again, not just me, but other people. There's a lot of people that are fighting to improve our industry. But if you take a look at something and run it through a filter, Becky, how many solutions, and there's lots of them, are entirely focused on acquiring a customer? And how many are focused on retaining one? So there are thousands of products about acquiring a customer, and there's almost nothing in retention. But then we go back to that rhetorical question, is it our mission to only sell a car, also earn a reoccurring customer, where actions and processes speak louder than words? If all of our bandwidth is put into acquiring a customer, that's good. That's an important part of the process. But is that it? And that's the question for our industry. And I promise you, there are people solving it. Well, I know three years ago when I reached out to you or however, which way I was introduced to you, Stephen, was um, remarkable in of itself. And where, you know, you have come just in three years alone, being able to offer this um, option technology to our dealers and how very important that is. Because frankly, you're right. When we were talking about it three years ago, it was we can bang up our, it's a great idea. Right. There's everyone gets it about that reoccurring customer and how we can get back in front of that customer and offer maybe customers the um, option to take advantage of a service contract or any other ancillary products. We all know that that's a super great idea. No one's doing it. And, and that's know, where you again, come in. It's missing because of process. I don't think it's desire. You know, do dealers want to sell more service contracts and warranties? Right. Yep. Of course, yes, of they, course do, they do. Right? But what we're trying to do is jam everything into this micro moment. Well, uh, it's, it's yeah. the same thing, Becky, about process. You know, again, if we contemplate, if we don't get them right now, we'll never get them. That's almost giving up and saying, we're going to sell them a car. And once they walk out, they're, we're never going to see them again. So we better damn well get this done right now. It's the same thing about this best practice of, Let's go introduce the customer to the service drive in the context of them buying a car. Now, if you don't think you have any other moment, you better drag their ass back there to the, the service drive, right? You better show it to them. But think about that from the psychology of a customer, whether it's a brand new car or pre-owned car that's new to the customer, when they're buying it, are they thinking about servicing it? No, they're thinking about getting off the lot and going. But that still should be a valuable touch point as long as you have a conduit and a mechanism to communicate to them effectively afterwards. Like I said, how about first? We owe this to every customer. Thanks for buying a car from us. Yep. You had a choice and you chose us. Thank you. We're not going to let you down. Welcome to the family. We're looking forward to being on this ownership journey with you. And then that service director that comes on they can make a video that attaches to the push notification, one video that says, hey, let me give you a tour of why we're experts. We built this building and we train these people specifically for you and inspire people where they're not thinking about any other place to go than the best place to go, which is my dealer. And right now that's lost. That's totally lost. But it's not lost because of desire. It's lost because of awareness and process. Mm -hmm. we're, we're missing that connection, that connect the disconnected. 
You have a customer. Do you desire to keep them? If so, how? That's and right. the birthday postcard once a year is not the way. We have to connect with them in a way that customers want to be connected. I think it's got to be seamless. It's got to be, it, you, you've got to put in a seamless process and it's got to be self-automated, if you will, and getting it, getting the information out in front of that customer on a periodic basis, however, which way not notifications are being done. But it just, it just stands to reason that you're going to get a lot more from customer relationship because of the communication and also some of the other products that the customer may have not been taken advantage of. And it's, why, it's, Becky, it's so widely known. Customers don't desire to be sold. Yeah. Educate me. Yeah. Make me aware. And then let me make a decision on my terms and people will do it. And this is another thing, you know, again, I want to, in a few moments we have left here, I want to underscore this, even though I'm a digital contributor, that doesn't mean, as far as I'm concerned, that a dealer abandons all of the analog or in-person things that work. Amen. I've never contemplated that. I've never suggested that. Technology done right removes the pain points so that those in-person events are more valuable. That's, That's right. what it's there for. Yep. Right? Absolutely. The, the idea of a dealership's identity and the unique things they bring you can bring it and you can amplify it by having the right conduit and the right processes to do it. It doesn't mean we don't talk to or touch our customers. It means we remove the longstanding pain points or we fill the vacancies where those things are not inspiring the customer to come back. And that's what technology today, if it's done right, is what you do. We call it your dealer experience. Why? It's not my experience. And it's not your experience. It's the dealer's experience with their customer. And this is where, again, there's going to be a fight. There's going to be an identity crisis that we'll continue to talk about and engage for the days, weeks, and months, and years to come ahead is, is the most important relationship in the auto retailing industry between the dealer and their customer or between the OEM and the dealer's customer? Oh, there you go. There you go. If that's a good one. If the dealer doesn't fill that gap, somebody will. Yep. And that's where, again, we have to stand up. We can't just accept status quo is okay. It's not. And, that's you know, we're contributing to it. You're contributing to it. These forums like this, Becky, are so valuable because when voices begin to align, we can move mountains together. Amen. I, I know that there are dealers out there. I know that there are support community people out there that feel exactly the same way. We shouldn't be working apart. We should be working together to achieve the desired result. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And Stephen, we are out of time here. And thank you so very much. I mean, I know I could talk to you for another good, another good 30 minutes, if not longer. And um, I appreciate you being here for FNI Master Series of Forum and our first of many. And we'll make it a point in the fall to make sure that we come up with that uh, physical location uh, for the event in Atlanta, Georgia. So I love it. I love it. Becky, you're amazing. You're a great you. leader. Thank, thank you. you for the chance. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bob Farlow, welcome to FNI Master Series Forum, The Digital Age. And it's certainly a pleasure to have you here with us at this terrific event. And for those that may not necessarily know who Bob Farlow is, although I can't imagine that no one knows who Bob Farlow is, if you wouldn't mind, first share your background um, with us. Well, us I, uh, I started a car dealership. Um, 
working in the parts department, actually, uh, when it was my senior year of high school. And so I've been around cars and car dealerships my entire life. And and uh, right out of school, started selling cars and have worked in just about every position in a car dealership um, that there is, uh, with the exception of controller. And um, I love the business. I love the people. I love the customers. I loved everything about it. And so um, obviously, I decided to make a career out of it. And so this year, actually last year in November, I, I said goodbye and retired, semi-retired, I guess you want to call it. I am doing some work for some folks. But uh, bottom line is, um, there's not a better business, in, the, in my opinion, there's not a better business in the world for somebody who um, decides they want to make a career. Uh, if you work hard at it and you build a, a base of customers and you get into you know, management and you, you have to develop your leadership skills and build a team, uh, it's still the best kept secret in the free enterprise system. It's one of the best businesses um, out there. So I've been blessed to, to have been in it and, and mentored under a lot of great people, a lot of names that you would know and others would know, and uh, just feel very uh, grateful and fortunate that I've been able to uh, to have a, a pretty good impact uh, where I have been. Well, you certainly have, and you certainly have had an impact on me as well and in my career, and I can always thank you so much for that. But Bob, well, you are also been a GM, um, a fantastic GM at McGeorge Toyota. I don't even know how many years that you've been or were at uh, McGeorge Toyota and you've done a terrific job with them as well as a uh, market president for AutoNation for several years. And you also worked with um, the Coons company, uh, comp corporate companies as the GM. So you really do have a major impressive uh, background in automotive retail, sales. And so this is one of the reasons why I thought it would be ideal to bring you on because I want it, you know, what I want to do is I want to hear it from the dealer's voice about all these changes that are, that, that they're being hit with as it pertains to this Evanai Profit Center. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, there's a lot of conversation, as you well know, on DR, digital retailing. Mm -hmm. And so is it just like a buzzword? What is it to dealers? What do they think it is? And is it just a maybe a lead gen? How do you see this playing out? You know, I, I think, you know, we... Uh... Uh, my, my nephew, I think I shared this with you when we talked earlier, my nephew is a kind of a big wheel with, uh, with Amazon Web Services. He manages people from all over the United States, actually all over the world. And he's been with them now for about uh, eight or nine years. And uh, so I've got a little inside track into the web world, the digital world. And we talk a lot about, you know, what Amazon does, what he can tell me without having to kill me. Um, <laughs> And you know, one of the things that, that we couldn't imagine is uh, 10 years ago is Amazon being in the position they are today. But what happened was somebody saw it, I don't know if it was Bezos or whoever, but somebody at Amazon saw where things were going and said, you know what? We need to get in this game and we need to get out ahead of everybody. And 10 years later, whatever the, the time frame is, they started taking off, they are now the kings of retail. And who would have ever thought that you would be on a computer buying a, a, a whatever it is you want to buy and have it delivered to your door the next day. Customers were asking for that in, in that digital re, in that digital space, and with the pandemic, as we know in the car business, uh, it created a created a um, a need for us as dealers to figure out okay how do we conduct business in a manner where a customer feels comfortable um interacting with our dealership and so for us when i was in mcgeorge that took on various states whether it was picking a vehicle up for service um whether it was uh, delivering a car for a tussle's test drive whatever those things may have been uh, we were able to execute that and uh, as i've always said um, change before you have to because if you change before you have to you're out ahead of everybody and if you don't change then you're going to be changed. Somebody is going to come eat your lunch. Um, so uh, I think the digital retailing piece is here to stay um, in, a, in a much much bigger way than, than we even see it today. Um, 
and there needs to be a um, kind of a rally cry to say, hey, how do we, how can we be the leaders in doing business in a digital fashion um, if that's what the customer's asking for? And more and more customers are asking for that seamless, transparent, easy um, way to do business. And so um, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but it, it's, it is a. It is going to be. It's a big piece now. I think it's going to be an even larger piece in the future. Well, I I, I think that dealers are trying to um, think through how much of this do I really have to implement, and yeah. I I don't. So I think that some are getting the idea behind having some tools, technology online for customers to have the ability to toggle through their terms and options that would be available as they shop from one car to another. But the issue, but the, the it's connecting the dots. It, I think that we're unplugged. It's like, okay, we're online and we might even have conversations with our BDC, but yet when it comes to that customer, when they get into the dealership, it's all bets are off. Right. We're going to start all over again. This is right. our world you just entered into. Maybe that was, you know, your world, but welcome right. to my world. And now it all starts. And so what you're talking about, and you're right, change is difficult. It's very difficult. I know what I went through. I know what you went through when we implemented menu for the first time. It wasn't easy. <laughs> And I keep talking about those days, but you know, 20 years ago when we first talked menu, it was like people thought, what yeah. kind of cool later you drinking? How yeah. is that gonna work? So I think we're just kind of going into the same place. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take work to to implement a process or utilizing this technology to leverage the impact that we want to see in our dealership and every dealer is different in how they do stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, I think if we look at it from the customer's perspective, um, as we launched, we launched a digital platform five years ago in George, it was called McGeorge at Home. And it was launched with some success. We did probably five to eight in a good month, 10% of our business on McGeorge at Home. And uh, we said, well, we need a new iteration of that now. We need to kind of take that up and we see what's coming and so we're going to make some changes and, and it, it, uh, we actually branded it with George Express, which you can go online and see that. Um, well, as luck would have it in our case, <laughs> about the time we launched it, um, <clears throat> which is the end of 19, uh, we know what happened in March of 2020. Yes, and do. we're in the catbird seat in terms of being able to uh, transact business digitally when a lot of people are still trying to figure it out. We already had it. Uh, so beginning really in April and May, I mean, the, the, the response went through the roof in terms of, you know, people wanting us to pick their cars up, people wanting to get cars delivered, uh, doing all the transaction online and, or the vast majority of it. Uh, but then we offer the customer options. Um, I'm a big believer in tell me how you want it, and that's how I'll do my best to deliver it. And so I think you have a lot of people, the Carvana model, some of the others where it's like, hey, never have to go anywhere. We bring a, um, a roll back to your house and drop the car off. Uh, but then I think you also have other people that want to touch the car. They want to see the car. They want to talk to someone face to face. Um, and so we have to have a solution that touches all those points for the customer as they as they ask for it and give them the information that they, they need to make an informed decision. Um, and it really does make it simple for everybody if you're able to do that. Um, and, and probably the biggest barrier that I faced when we were uh, kind of relaunching the Express thing was, um, and it falls into the category of whenever you make a change, I was taught and, and experience has taught me that 10 to 20% of the people that you lead and work with are going to be early adopters. They're going to go, boss, that's a great idea. We're going to absolutely crush it. Let's go. You're going to have another 10 or 20 percent that are the naysayers on the other side saying, oh, my gosh, I can't believe we're doing this. He's gone crazy. What's wrong with Farlow? Um, I always focused on the middle 60 percent that said, show me why. Tell me the why. Show me you're committed to it. 
and you can get me off the fence onto the side with the early adopters. And once I get 60 or 70 percent of the people on board that are, that are like, OK, we get it, then you can then you can move. It took me six months uh, to get everybody on board with the new Express thing. And if you went to that dealership today and said, I'm taking it away, everybody would leave because it's made business easy and simple for the salespeople, for the sales managers, for the customers. But the fight to get there was a fight. It wasn't easy. It wasn't something we just said, oh, let's, you know, let's do this. And unfortunately, and I'm guilty of it too, you know, dealers are like, okay, let's, you know, ready, fire, aim, ready, fire, aim. And, and you can't do that with something that's important. If you really need the entire team tuned in to, to the why behind you're doing it. And once they understand the why, and then once the customers start writing you emails saying, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. I can't believe you're doing this. One funny story I'll share real quick. When we started the, um, the pickup and delivery of cars early in the pandemic, um, one of our good customer of ours, they bought uh, 15 or 20 cars from us. So they called up and said, hey, I need to get my camera service. And then, okay, great. We'll come pick it up. And calls back about an hour later. He's like, can I, can I get all my cars brought over there? And we're like, absolutely. We'll come pick all. And so we picked up his, it was five cars. And oh, wow. was, over the next two days, serviced them and brought them back. Uh, and then we, we tell those stories, or employees see them, or we tell those stories to the employees, like, oh, okay, I see how this works now. So um, it's a lot of hard work to, to do, but, you know, we felt, and I felt, and I really still feel it's, it's necessary to, to continue to try to refine that to make it easy for the customer. Well, okay, and I like that because easy is better, more efficiency is better is always proven to be more profitable. And, Absolutely. and, and, you know, if a customer enjoys the buying experience, they're going to buy again and again, retention is key. And that's what we have to keep. We have to consider. It's just not that one moment. It's all the other moments in front uh, pre-sale during and after that we really need to be paying attention to be able to get that reoccurring business. Cause we all know that a repeat customer is the, best customer <laughs> still holds true today, Bob, <laughs> but here's the thing. Let's call it what it is. And this is, again, this is why I love you. I mean, just absolutely adore you because you call it the way it is. You always have been that been that way with me, but more dealers today, let's face it. I mean, these guys are making more profit than they've ever made in history. Mm -hmm. Many of them. Yes. All of them. Okay. I mean, there they are. I mean, happy. Their lives are great. I mean, it's, it's cool. Why? And so now they're in a situation where, you know what? Things are great. Why change? What do because, you say to them? Well, because things are not going to be great in the future. And we are in a cyclical business. Um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, uh, whether it's the real estate market currently and selling houses and or selling cars. Um, the current market, I can't explain it. I don't think anybody can really explain it. Why it's so white hot, uh, the way it is, the uh, demand, uh, outstripping supply, like we've never seen, but that has the danger of making a blind squirrel look like a sniper. Okay. And what I mean by that is, you know, the old blind squirrel gets another once in a while, but business is so robust. It is so hot. It is so strong that we are hiding weaknesses currently that will expose themselves over the next six months, year, year and a half, whatever that might be. And then it's too late because if you've gotten your bad habits, uh, done the wrong things, not trained your people properly, not taking good care of customers, when things turn around and they always do, uh, you want to be on the top of the heap. You want to be the one that's leading the charge out of it. Um, and unfortunately, I think there's going to be a lot of dealers that suffer as a result of that. Um, one of my really good friends who I've helped him, you know, with, with a couple of things. I'm not for hiring. I'm not for hire. But I said, hey, how much, how much reserve are you holding for a used car right there? And he's made a fortune. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, how much reserve are you holding for a used car right now when the used car market adjusts right now? If you get a $4 million inventory, you're holding 10%, 20%. .10. I'm not holding anything. I said, why would you not hold a reserve for what you know is 
you don't have a crystal ball. When this used, the, the used car market is up 50% from two years ago in terms of value. Wow. And when it's just that, guess what's going down? 50%. Yeah. So the reason I say that is there's a lot of dangers hidden in this current, in this current boom that we're in the middle of that if you're not thinking about it or we're not prudent and we're not somewhat conservative, when things do adjust, it's going to be, it's going to be bad. Um, now, the, the smart dealers are, are doing things like we're talking about. They're continuing to train people. They're, they're not true, charging over list price for cars. What happens when a customer comes back that's paid tens of thousands of dollars over list price and you try and trade them out of that car three or four or five years from now? How are they going to feel? Things like that. So there's so many dynamics at play right now that if you're, if you're, you know, if you're really in this for the long haul, you need to be paying attention to things like this and the digital piece of it and making it simple and easy and transparent and, and, and um, you know, what I call a pull sale as opposed to a push sale. It's always better for a customer to decide what they want and how they want it. And if I have the ability to show them how to do that, I'm going to win. So speaking of that, there's been conversation in the marketplace, some digital retail or Retailers talk about the single point F and I approach. What are your thoughts on a single point F and I approach? And the reason why I say this is because I'm hearing it from all sorts of sides. I mean, these F and I people are like, you are talking, Becky, the F, the death of F and I. Mm-hmm. And there's some things to 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 talk through this because. Okay, what about that F and I person that we know we love? You and I are both on the same page. Mm-hmm. You know, I was always trained: get out there, Becky, find a way to go ahead, put that deal together, make that deal better. That is a job of the finance manager. You know, yeah. you get a deal from the desk. Maybe they put it together, but you know what? Chances are, F and I can get out there and make that deal better. Can that really happen? And I know I'm putting you on the spot, yeah, but no, let's I, talk about it. Yeah, Single no, think, point sales associate, could, could they possibly do anything along those lines? Yeah, I think, I, I think it can happen. I mean, you know, it was it, not a lot of things were before you're in my time, right? But one of the things this was before you're in my time in car <laughs> business was F&I didn't really exist in the 70s. You didn't really have an F&I department. And the F&I department got developed. And it's like, okay, in the 80s, it took off and then kind of been the same way, you know, since then. But um, to, to think that things are not going to change in the future, again, is wrong. And so I think you have to take all ideas, put them on the table, pluses and minuses, the Ben Franklin, however you make your decisions, um, and say, hey, is this something that is better for our people, better for the customer, better for the transaction? And, and you can train. You've trained, you know, dozens of people for me. And you could train even more. And and so, you know, I think that's definitely a conversation. It's not something you just kind of go, okay, let's do that tomorrow. But um, yeah, I, I believe it could work. And it, it provides economies and scales for dealerships that you'd have fewer employees doing more, doing, you know, more functions. Uh, you could pay that person more money. I mean, there's a lot of good things that could come out of that. Um, but it's definitely something that needs to to hit the table as an idea of, you know, how to structure the dealership of the future, because that's where we're in the middle of right now. We're, we're the changes that we've been through as dealers in the last two, three years. It's been so much. You can't even remember it all. Well, I think where that's coming from is because of all this time it takes the friction. Mm -hmm. So of uh, getting that customer from the time that they're in the dealership, my gosh, it's three, four hours by the time they make their way into an f and office. And it's like, people are like, you know what? I'm done with that. I don't mm-hmm. want to spend all day in the dealership. I don't mind buying a vehicle at the dealership. I don't mind the brick and mortar experience. I just don't want to spend all day in the dealership doing it. But okay. So there's a uh, GM, Brian Kramer and I had the chance to really get a better understanding and what he has been able to do. And again, this happened with COVID. He took the opportunity and he made it a point to implement a completely digitalized workflow Mm -hmm. from online to in dealership. There's not a 
paper. There's not a nothing that hits the floor. Now mm -hmm. I will tell you his evident person. And there were several that left. They couldn't handle it mm -hmm. because he wanted a completely digitalized experience mm -hmm. using prodigy to, um, for their desking and uploading documents or, scanning documents, however, which way, and then from there, um, utilizing Darwin for that digital menu presentation and finalizing everything through e-contracting, financing, and leasing. And I'm talking pretty much 99.9%. .9%. Now, mm -hmm. I know I'm talking 1% out there, mm -hmm. but I got to tell you, so I brought, so I brought his Evan I manager on my live talk with Becky Chernick. And I, and, and the reason why I wanted her to talk about that journey and how uncomfortable it was. Mm -hmm. But I think you, you, you mentioned something there earlier. You said your people, there were some that bought in immediately and she mm -hmm. wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she'll be the first to admit it. Mm -hmm. She fought it tooth and nail, mm -hmm. but Brian, held his own like you would mm -hmm. or do and said, yeah. this is a decision that I'm making. You're either going to be on this ship. It's my Harbor. This is my ship. Yeah. Or you got to do something different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's the, that bold of a decision, but yeah. looking back, here's what they've got, Bob. They don't have a CIT in issues anymore. They don't right. have chargebacks. Right. They don't have tag and title issues. All that is gone. And, you yeah. know, Dora's wanted to tell you, I'll take a cash deal. I'll take a finance deal. I'll take a lease deal. Yeah. I love it. Right. So what do you say yeah. about that? Well, you know, and uh, you teed me up for this. You know that, <laughs> George, we were 100% digital pretty much um, for a while. And um, we, we were one of the top in, in our region and one of the top in the country in um, – straight through processing, which which is something if you e-contract a customer with Toyota and you have all your documents and everything's in order and you hit the you send button, two minutes later, the money is in your account as a dealer. So we, we would run in the 50 to 60 percent range typically on contracts, uh, you know, every single day. And then we would have four or five others that we'd have to correct or 10 the next day. And we got we had our money. Our money was there instantly. So. Um, that's real. That that works. And if you work it right, you, you, you don't have you're you're working off the bank's money. You're not working off of your money. Like you said, contract and transit list in a good size store can be a big number. Um, but I, you know, I think it's you said uh, Brian. I think you said was his name. You know, it takes a Brian to say this is what we're doing. Now, hopefully, and I'm sure he did. He had that sixty percent on board before he said this is what we're doing. Okay. Knowing he was going to lose one or two people, but I've always been in the mindset. It's all about the team. I'm going to treat you as an individual, but you need to be part of the team. And, and that's his philosophy. I'm sure too. It's like, this is what we need to do for our dealership, for our team, our team members. And once people see that they buy in and six months later, they go, huh, this is the greatest thing since nighttime baseball. This is, I don't know why we didn't do this two years ago, but it takes courage and leadership from the dealer and or the general manager to say, this is the path we've chosen. And, um, and it absolutely works if you have people that are understanding of the process. Um, you know, I was thinking about an analogy. No, I was going to talk to you today. I mean, you know, when you're trying to teach a child how to walk, okay, get a little baby, you're trying, trying to teach a child how to walk. Well, number one, what is that child, if you're that child's parent or aunt or whatever, what does that child know? That child trusts you, okay? Number one thing is they trust you. And so you say, okay, let's take a step. And they take a step or two and they fall down and you pick them back up. And they take two more and you pick them back up. But the basis of why they can learn is they trust you. And if your employees trust you, that you they know that you have their best interest at heart, and in this case, the customer as well, they're going to fall. They're going to stumble. And you got to say, hey, you know what? It's okay. This is new. <laughs> we're all learning, but we're still moving forward. Um, but the trust can't be understated. You have to have the trust of your employees uh, with you 
in order mm-hmm. to make it work. And so, so I think, you know, you, you know, you look at a Brian store and that is like overwhelming. It mm-hmm. is, you know, to it many dealers, maybe not to you some, but to, to many dealers, this is like, are you kidding me? This mm-hmm. is like really hard to do. So mm-hmm. instead of, you know, eating the, the, the whole elephant, as they say, mm-hmm. something's better than nothing. Right. But sitting there and just kind of like closed minded about it isn't right. going to make it all go away. No. No, the, the bad man is still in the closet. The monster's still in the closet. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> bad man's not going away. It, it's That's business, whether it's car business, whether it's any business. I mean, things are changing at such a rapid, and technology is part of what's doing it, right? Yeah. You have, I'm not a geek head when it comes to technology, you know that, but I love what technology can do. And I find people that understand it better than I do, and I put them to work and say, let's figure this out, how we can make it better for everything. Some of the things, some of the tools that we use now, uh, today, I couldn't have dreamed about even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, it, it's amazing the technology that we have, both in the sales and service operations, that allow us to make much better decisions, quicker decisions, get more data, have better meetings. It, it's it's all technology based. So if that's true, and it is, then why wouldn't you take that technology and figure out how to make a better sales process? that would benefit everybody, the customer, the lender, you, the salesperson, right? It it gets back to the hard work piece. And and I think people, you know, dealers are smart. Dealers are some of the smartest people you've ever been around. They're also some of the most dynamic and flexible people you've ever been around, you've been around your whole life. Uh, But they're also a little hard-headed, can be, right? We all are. I am too. I know um, my dad was. <laughs> I know. I, I'm, I'm that way I guess but I get a little I, bit of that. I, hope, I really do hope that, that dealers are paying attention to everything that's going on in the, in the retail environment, not just in auto, but in all retail, and say, hey, there, there has to be a way that I can, uh, you know, make more market share in my market by, by getting more. And we did. I mean, we actually increased our local market share, but when we went, we went kind of full digital. Um, you know, and you know, there's an old saying, uh, I'm going to get it right. It says, uh, uh, when you don't make excuses, you get results. You know, there's a million excuses where there's a million excuses of why we shouldn't do it. Uh, but, but we're not going to get any results. Uh, I want results. We want results for everybody. We can't make excuses. We have to jump in and, and start rowing and, and, and do the best we can do because Everything around is pointing to this is the new this is the new car business in, in, in that realm. I think what may, you know, when we had a conversation, I think you mentioned something about somehow or another, this digital age is all around automotive. But somehow dealers still feel as if they're isolated. Does do you remember when we, we were kind of talking through that and that piece and so I don't think it's something it's here. It's now it's happening. And, and if you embrace it, so like what I'm also hearing and seeing uh, Bob is when they do that, we're getting a greater impact in our F and I performance because mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. So last mm-hmm. words for our dealers. I can't believe how quick this time went. <laughs> <laughs> right. Always with you. Yeah, well, I I, I appreciate spending the time with you. I hope it's been helpful. So what do you, I mean, so in, you know, closing, (laughs) what are your thoughts as far as helping dealers to understand that if they embrace some of these uh, (laughs) new technologies that they can actually impact their F&I office? It's not that, I think there's that fear factor that I've got to protect the the golden nugget, right? The goose, the golden goose. And that's the F and I department at all costs. And I'm saying, you know what? I hear you. I get you, but we have digital age. It's all around you. Mm -hmm. So you have to do a better job in embracing that. But when you do, you end up impacting that F and I. I think what I would point to Becky, if I were you is, you know, the, the, uh, the lithiums of the world, um, 
that have the driveway program, the, the, the larger companies, the CarMaxes of the world that have the omni-channel now. And I don't want to say it's easier for them, but it, it is kind of easier for them. They got bigger staff, more money, you know, uh, more margin for error than, 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 than let's say I do. But the reality of that is they're making it work and they're making it work at a higher level. And if we're not careful, too many of the big ones get too big that's going to take more from us than, than we'd like to see happen. Um, so there's a, there's a little bit of caution there to say, Hey, you know, not be scared, but look over your show a little bit. Some of these big, some of these big fellas are really, you know, dialing into this thing and getting it to the point where, you know, they've got it, they've got it ironed out to a very high degree. Um, and then, you know, I would encourage, uh, what, what motivated me when, when we got into it five years ago, and then again, a couple of years ago was, um, you know, I have to take care of my sales force because the sales force is what makes a dealership go. Uh, they start the process, you know, everybody there is important, but if you're not selling cars, you're not, you don't have a business. And so, you know, thinking about how I could take care of my sales force was how do I make it easier, simpler, uh, where they could sell more cars in about the same time, you know, turned out that we actually made more money in F and I than we did before we made the switch over. It took us a while, but about six months we got there. Um, so if you truly care about, I think if you truly care about the business long term, you truly care about the people that make the business go, which is a salesperson, it's like let's give them the tools um, to, to do more and less time and for customers to feel better about how the actual process went. And if you put the time, effort, and energy into it, it, it absolutely positively works. If you talk to folks that have done it and are doing it now, I think they would tell you the exact same thing I'm telling you, which is, you know, you got to take a hard look at it and you got to bite the bullet and, and you got to put the work in in order to get the results, um, you know, with no excuses. Um, and that's where the results will come in. Well, here we go. You know, Bob, thank you again. And I couldn't agree with you more. And I guess that's why we've always been in alignment for, I don't know, a long time. Very long time. <laughs> Very long time. Don't date me. <laughs> but thank you again, Bob. And I appreciate you for the okay. time. Thank Perfect. you. Josh, here we are, and welcome again to the F and I Master Series Forum, the Digital Age. And I couldn't, I couldn't thank you enough for taking the time to be here with us today. Yeah, you so, bet. so to get things started, um, I think it's really a good idea that you share your background with everyone, so they get a bit of an idea of your experience in the automotive retail industry and you are also the managing partner at the foundation auto colorado yeah yeah so i've got uh i've got five stores in here in colorado and the managing partner we've got a chevrolet store cadillac kia and two hyundai stores um we bought uh, our first store here august of 2020 and we've kind of grown grown since then and um and it's it's all i've ever done in the car business i mean i started selling cars when i was 18 and and you know been in finance and director and spy fi and uh obviously gsm gm and all that so this is what i love to do well well you certainly have uh the the pulse of the industry and so this is why it's so exciting always to bring you in because i think you know what you do what you share is uh realistic what's going on in the dealership right approach it's and i think a lot of times some of the dealers are saying ah I don't know if this is really taking place as far as everybody gets so excited about digital retailing and, yeah. you know, what's going on with that. And, but first, before we get into that piece, how do you see this market? You know, um, how is that going to uh, bear out, if you will, with regard to market value on these pre-owned vehicles? How do you see that in the next year and a half? 
Yeah, boy. Um, if I had a crystal ball, I would, yeah, I'd be even more successful, I guess. Uh, it'll be interesting because I think you're going to see the supply of new cars come back a little bit. Most of the manufacturers I'm talking to say they're going to produce about 30% more vehicles. Now, that's not going to translate to 30% more sales. Some of that's going to be actual ground stock. We don't know what that's like, but we might actually have some stock on the ground. Um, and that might depress the values of used cars a little bit. But the problem that we also have is, and a lot of people are thinking about this, for the last two years, we haven't sold very many new cars. So a year from now, we're not going to have very many one and two year old cars out there, which is going to, again, bring the values back up. So I see some of my friends out there communicating, saying we're going we're to have this huge decline. As soon as the, the new cars come back online, used cars are going to drop like a rock. I don't see that. I really see that there's that tight supply of, of pre-owned cars is still going to be there only because we didn't produce 17 million new cars, you know, like we have in years past. So there's going to be um, a low supply with a high demand because the price of new cars is still going to go up. So people are going to want to save some money on a pre-owned car. Now, I don't think it'll be like it is right now where a one year old truck on my lot is priced higher than a brand new truck on my lot. I don't think we're going to be there, but we're not going to have this big cliff that these values are going to drop off. Well, that's certainly good to know. Um, obviously, everybody wants to make sure that um, that they're able to keep up with what's happening in the marketplace, right? So that yeah. way we can always maximize profits. And I'm, and I'm sure the lenders and that sort of thing is also really making sure that they're keeping up with what's going on as well. Yeah. And how do you see the loan to value playing out their guidelines? Are they going to say, you think that they're going to pretty much stay the same? Now, one of the things we had a couple of uh, um, speakers on talking about um, how AI is being more utilized than the FICO score necessarily. So that could, that could be a game changer. In- yeah. It's, it's interesting too. I mean, I, I remember back in the days where we had, uh, I had my Wells Fargo rep, he would take somebody who had no credit on their bureau, but I could get uh, uh, rental referrals. I could get the referral from their insurance company showing that they've made payments on time. So it's interesting, you know, we can go outside the box and, um, and, and and deviate from that FICO score or even from that internal scorecard that the, a lot of the banks use. And, you know, it's just written on a rock and brought down from a mountain and this is it, you know, and, and we've got to deviate from that, I think. Um, but loan to values, I don't anticipate those changing. Um, I, I think, you know, if something dramatic or drastic came about, they could, but most of the banks, you don't see them uh, making knee jerk reactions with just about anything. So I don't anticipate any sort of, you know, uh, quick knee jerk type reaction from a loan to value standpoint. So some of, I also have, I've been having conversations about talent on the floor and, mm-hmm. you know, especially, you know, in, with me, you know, for years, I was always trained. My job in F and I was to get out, meet with the customer, and no matter how that deal was desked, it was up to me to make it better mm-hmm. and to find and figure out ways to go ahead and maximize profits. And I think I did pretty darn good with that. But it comes with skill. Yeah, it's just not something that you try to figure out if you don't know your lenders, if you don't have that proper skill set in, um, you lose that ability to, to, to do that. So, you know, with everything going on the past year or two, I mean, it's been, I mean, it's been awesome. I mean, dealers are making profit. I mean, left and right more profit than ever before. So does this mean though, that perhaps maybe it's so easy that some of the managers maybe their skill set is just not as robust as it used to be. Absolutely. I mean, and we talk about this all the time. I mean, we're, we're seeing, and again, and we actually talked to this off camera a little bit in regards to something else, but we uh, we're in a, in a period right now where we're being almost rewarded for bad behavior. And unfortunately it's been two years. It's not like it was a couple months and we can snap out of it. We've got two years of behavior now where if you don't want to follow up with your customer, you don't have to. If you don't want to advertise, you don't have to. If you don't want to have the fastest internet response, you don't have to, because if you have the car, you're going to sell the car. You can have poor customer service. You can have, I mean, just absolutely atrocious from every aspect. But if you have that, you know, black on black, high country, silver auto, or that tell you ride or whatever it is, you're going to sell it. 
Um, and so that's, uh, it's an unfortunate thing. So we've gotten lazy for the most part, painting with a broad brush, not everybody. So don't get your feelings hurt. But for the most part, as an industry, we've gotten lazy because we don't have to work hard to be successful. So it's going to be really important um, that if you want to be successful as a dealership, that as we come out of this, and it's not going to be, again, there's no light switch and we got 500 cars on the lot again. That's not going to happen. But there's going to be a time, and actually I talked about this on Friday at my sales meeting, here in the near future where every Chevy store has that black on black Chevy Silverado and the customer knows that. You know, we may not have 10 of them, but there's five or six stores in Denver that are going to have one or two of them. And, and you're going to have to have a high level of customer service. You're going to have to differentiate yourself from the other dealers out there. You're going to have to return some phone calls. You're going to have to know your word tracks and how to overcome objections and, and all of those things that, uh, you know, that quite frankly, we, we just probably that, that saw has gotten a little dull recently because we haven't needed to sharpen it. So, um, so I, I mean, we're, I mean, we're working on it. We've been talking about it for over a year now, but we're really working on hard on our word tracks, on our phone scripts, on, on really everything. So that when that market does get competitive, I want a head start. You know, I don't want to have wait two or three months and go, wow, we're losing some sales to the guys down the road. I want to already be sharp and ready to go. See, and that's exactly what the top professionals in the industry, they, that's what they do. They don't just hang around and kind of wait on the, the seasons to change. Yeah. They're very proactive before the seasons change and they're going to, you know, Dave Anderson, he is a, a love, I love his um, talks and, you know, that's something that he shares with his dealers all the time that seasons change. You've got to prepare, you know, for that. And, you know, just like you, for me, one thing that I always press, and you know, I talk about this until the cows come home and you know about those cows, <laughs> or maybe not, but I bang up my head against the wall on this darn interview and meeting customers and really getting out there and, and engaging with that customer. And here's the thing. I engage, I don't care where they are. Josh, they could be on the, they could be, you know, at their home, they can be in their office, they can be, you know, out on the floor, but wherever that they are, however, which way that they are, that's where I want to meet and engage and get that information. The very last thing, especially with these ordered vehicles, we, you know, we have more ordered vehicles than ever before. Why isn't F and I making the point to get out and, or to contact that customer? And make sure, you know, we address any uh, questions the customer may have as it pertains to financing. We yeah. want to keep those customers captive in the dealership. Yes? I'm sorry. What was We want to keep the customers captive in the dealership. And, you know, by that, getting Evan I involved sooner and yeah. making sure, like, on ordered vehicles, we're, we're, we're contacting the customer beforehand, before yeah. they even make their way into the dealership. Yeah. And I think that goes back to, I mean, just kind of the one basic thing with any sort of relationship and that's communication, right? Whether it's, you know, me and my wife or whether it's me and a customer, if I communicate better with them, I'm more likely to get the results that I want. Um, and it's a, it's a definitely different business now that we know from selling ordered units, selling into the pipeline. Um, I mean, all of that stuff is, I mean, you know, selling cars off the truck, you know, it used to be only the hot model. Now it's the, the Equinox you're selling off the truck. I mean, it's just, very strange, but if we can increase our level of communication yeah. with that customer, um, I, I truly believe that getting the results that we want, which from an F and I standpoint would be products and reserve and, you know, and all that stuff, um, yeah. we're going to increase that likelihood that we're going to get the results that we want for sure. So let me ask you this. And again, I'm putting you a little bit on the spot now. Um, pre-sales, yep. pre, pre-review, pre-sale, pre-review, like I think it's, for me, I think it's important that the customer has the ability to know that their products available before they get into the dealership. Now, yep. some not necessarily agree with me because yeah, it's I always been, huh? Yeah, I could see that. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, are you kidding, Becky? Yeah. You've been enough I, and I, I you know better than way. this. It would be interesting to see a case study, right? one way one way because i think you know a lot of a lot of car people would probably say i don't want them to think about it for six months while their vehicle comes in um but i think if you sell it properly it's sold you know and that's the thing i think there's probably a whole segment of finance managers that don't maybe necessarily disclose and sell everything properly so that 
it's it's kind of a house of cards. <laughs> and then they're thinking about it for six months and they go, oh, never mind, I don't want that. But yeah. if it's sold properly, um, I, I think it's sold no matter what. And and uh, and we see that now, even with chargebacks and you know that sort of thing. If it's not sold right, customers gonna you know come in and, and cancel it. So I think uh, I think it'll be interesting to look at it both ways. But um, I I think that if you do a great job selling it upfront, that it's sold, and even when they pick their vehicle up four or five six months down the road, they're still going to want it. And especially at the dollar amount that we're buying these vehicles at, oh my goodness! I mean, why would you not want to protect your your car? I mean, it's a you know, it's a, most people are stretching on their budget. You know, we're going out longer term. We're going out higher payments. Um, you know, I think, I think you would be only intelligent to protect your investment there. Well, it's kind of funny. It's ironic, really, if you think about it. Years ago, um, you know, when I first entered into the Canadian marketplace, right, and working with some of those um, car dealers there, it was very interesting because customers didn't take delivery of the vehicle. It would be, you know, it would be like three days afterwards after they applied the product. And I was like, what? What do you mean you're not taking delivery of the vehicle? Are you kidding me? So, you know, we got into, you know, let's do the presentation. Let's at least get that presentation in. And everybody was questioning that. And they were thinking, why do I want to do the presentation before the customer comes to pick up the vehicle? And I said, because if you think about it, You've got another second time around yeah. to revisit those products one more time. Yeah. And it worked. And it was just really kind of interesting. So I know we're cut for time, but I want to ask you about single point sales yeah. associates. Um, do you think that they're ready? To, are car dealers ready for a single uh, single sales approach when it comes to F&I? Yeah, I you know there's been Toyota I know makes a big push for it. Obviously the uh, the the Avondale uh, Toyota store in Phoenix was one of the first ones, and and they've done a good job. Um, but I, I think any GM owner, sales manager, we can look at our showroom floor and go, gosh, how many of those guys and gals out there can sell product legally, ethically, morally, get the paperwork right, do the whole process? And I think most of it would sit back and go. Man, I can't even get driver's license and insurance cards most of the time for my salespeople. How are they going to sell products? So I, I think it's a really tough stretch. I think the talent pool is lacking. Our turnover is still 100%. So we don't have any sort of consistency on the showroom floor. Um, and asking them to just perform the legal aspect of things, I think, is tough. When that's such a huge exposure for the dealership, you know, we don't want to be long go Toyota. You know, so <laughs> we don't want that to happen to us. No. So I think that's a huge stretch. And then there's the, the the financial aspect of it. I don't want to run eight hundred dollars a copy when I've got a you know a couple people in finance right now that are running three thousand dollars a copy. You know, so it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a stretch. I think with a few exceptions, like uh, you know maybe a Highline store where you're not selling a whole lot of warranties, it's a lot of lease and a lot of reserves. That might be an area of an exception, but for me, I just I can't quite make that stretch to. F and I. We're already letting our salespeople, which we'll talk about later, do some digital retailing on the showroom floor and essentially creating their own pencil. Um, but taking that leap from working the deal, at least preliminary on a first pencil, to letting them perform the F and I process, I know I'm not ready to take that leap. And I, and I think most dealers are probably in the same boat as me. I mean, that's a huge profit center to, be, you know, <laughs> to, to, to mess with, right, when it comes yeah. to that. And then I just see that, you know, Ev and I has a, and, and I hope we continue with the talent, supposed to have the talent. Yeah. And the, I, you know, we're not just clerks. I mean, I keep saying that to everyone. There's yeah. a lot there with us. And our responsibility is to manage that transaction and do whatever that we can yeah. to maximize the profits and yeah, we want to yeah, that protect the, the dealership assets. Yeah, here's the thing. We want to make sure that the customer experience is always improving. And that's an area that for you know three generations, we've absolutely tarnished it and ruined it ourselves. So we've got to get better at that. But um, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, when you've got a quarterback, when you've got Tom Brady throwing the football, <laughs> let's let Tom Brady throw the football. Let's not call the, the place kicker in and go, Hey, I think we might be able to do this a little better if you threw the. No, let's not. Let's not do that. Let's, uh, you know, if you've got a good process, and like I said, we always want to continue to improve the customer experience and speed it up, and you know, make sure we're doing a good job there. But 
when you've got some of these just absolute experts, let's let them be experts. And that's the way I look at it. And I'm, I'm definitely not not there yet with uh, with having my salespeople type car deals. And OK, so here's the thing. Um, let's talk, if you don't mind, about this digital retailing piece, yeah. because we're all over the we're all over the place. Yeah. I mean, I love to believe in all the Kool-Aid myself. I mean, I go to the conferences. I love what I hear. But in the reality, when we get back into the dealership, Josh, you and me are on the same page. What, what, what we talk about in some of these conferences to what's really taking place in the dealership, what's happening with that? Well, so I think I read something by J.D. Powers, which, of course, in the automobile industry, we love J.D. Powers. Consumer has no idea who they are, but uh, the manufacturers love them. But anyways... Um, I think I saw like 84% of the people uh, would prefer to do their transaction online. And I believe I got pitched that by a digital retailing vendor. And I said, that's fine, but that's a survey, right? So if you surveyed consumers and you said, hey, do you want to buy uh, a vehicle from a dealership who had deceptive advertising and pushy salespeople? 100% of them would say, no, I wouldn't want to do that. But I know a whole bunch of car dealers down the road that have deceptive ads and pushy salespeople that sell cars. So even though the consumer says they don't want to do something, that their behavior doesn't always match. And case in point is our digital retailing tool, whether it's Shop, Click, Driver, General Motors, or whether it's Autofy or WebBuy. We've had several of them now. And uh, the consumer, they'll start the process online. But as soon as they have to enter their social security number, that's when most of them go, whoa, I want to jump out and, and back out of this. So I think there's some sort of hybrid process where they can start stuff online to save themselves some time at the dealership. But the vast majority, 80% of our people using a bell curve, they're going to want to, you know, still see the car, smell the car. You know, they're going to want to shake hands with somebody, look someone in the eye, ask them some questions. It's a very intimate uh, purchase for a lot of people. And it's a very expensive purchase for a lot of people. I think you have 10% that no matter what, they don't want to talk to a human being and they want to do everything online. And 10% that no matter what, they don't want to do anything online and they want to come into the dealership. So as a dealership, we can truly benefit from, from that because we can do a hybrid process. We can do an online process. You know, we can do whatever anybody wants to do, but I, I, well, I'm not seeing the consumers ready. We advertise it, we push it. I've got it on all six of my websites. Um, you know, we really push it hard, but the consumers, they don't want to go through the entire process online. We're, we we see that right now. They're not quite there. Now, I know Carvana and Vroom are selling a whole bunch of cars. It's a very small percentage of the, of the market, but they're doing a good job with it. We can get better, uh, but I, I, right now I'm not seeing the consumers ready to do the entire transaction online. No, I, I agree with you. I think that they still appreciate the brick and mortar store. And there's just so much to that whole uh, sales approach and environment can be really very positive. I mean, we have some of the most beautiful stores out there. Yeah. And I can't imagine a customer not wanting to go ahead and take advantage of that. I think really, you're right. Um, they We've got to give them choice. Yep. how the customer wants to buy however, it's like up Burger to them. however they want to do it we <laughs> will do it you know yeah. we've got to make that again it's always we've got to make the customer experience better we've got to get faster our product knowledge has got to get better you know we we can do things internally to make that experience better for the consumer um but we're seeing people they're driving three hours to buy cars you know they're doing things that you know they know this is a big purchase so they know it's going to take some time to to make it work there is that small market segment right now and i'm sure it'll grow um, just like, you know, 20 years ago, nobody wanted to enter their credit card number on the internet, you know, and now it's like, I don't even think twice about it. I order everything online and everybody's <laughs> got my credit card number saved. And, you know, so I'm sure that market segment will grow and we can grow along with it. But right now, that's not where the consumer is. Most consumers, um, they want to see us. And like I said, whether that's a hybrid process where they start some things online and finish it at the store, which is probably where a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, my Kia store does a very good job of that. When they're setting appointments, they'll send our link over and say, hey, do as much as you want. You know, it'll save you 15 minutes up to maybe even an hour if you do some of this stuff online, depending on how much you do. Um, and we're getting a lot of customers that are starting to input some stuff online. Um, so the consumers are coming around, but they're definitely, we're not ready to flip that light switch and go, hey, we're 100% online right now. Well, you know, I've got uh, 321 Ignition and she, this gal, Lyman, she's uh, savvy, is very interesting because she talks about mobile devices and how dealers could do a much better job when it comes to making sure that their websites are mobile ready and friendly. And it's, 
it's an interesting, it's going to be an interesting conversation with her because she's going to be talking about the, um, the idea of getting more credit applications actually submitted, yeah. um, via on, on a mobile device because they have these features, um, a, um, APIs that's mm -hmm. embedded into these to be able to complete. It's like a smart way to complete the credit application. You know, you have just this one figure finger, but it's figuring stuff out. So it makes it a whole heck of a lot easier uh, to use. So I'm, I'm really excited about hearing that conversation because anything that we can do to make it more user friendly to get customers to submit that credit application, obviously is something we want to listen to. Yeah. But Josh, again, I, um, any, any last thoughts before we go ahead and wrap this up today? No, I just, I mean, I think as a dealer body, we've always got to be looking forward. We're, um, you know, we're a little archaic when it comes to our websites and all these things. Um, and we spend an obscene amount of money in the car business. I had a, a advertising friend of mine say he's been trying, you know, again, a lot of dealers aren't advertising right now because you don't have to. So he's been trying to branch off and he's got dentures, dentists and doctors. And he's like, you know, they'll do $1,500 here and $1,500 there. You guys will drop 20 grand without even thinking about it. You know, so um, we have got to make sure that we are investing uh, into our infrastructure and trying to look forward um, in how the customer wants to do business. So I know how it is right now, but, uh, you know, this is a, it's an evolution. So we want to make sure that we're not behind that curve and we don't become, you know, the blockbuster. We want to be the Netflix because we see there's a lot of disruptors out there that want to take our business. And we've got a bad reputation and a bad name. We've done it to ourselves, and they're trying to, you know, poke those yeah. poke those wounds right there. Um, so we need to evolve along with them. And some of those rooms and Carvanas, and you know, they're doing a good job. So we can learn a little bit from them, and we are better than them as a dealer body. You know, we are absolutely better than them. So we just want to look, try and look a little bit in the future, not get you know planted in where we are right now, or God forbid, you know, in the past, this worked for me a couple of years ago, because what worked for you a couple of years ago probably isn't going to work a couple of years from now. So um, real quick, I understand that you do utilize um, Autify, is that right? Yeah. Your yep. digital menu, as well as your DR system. Is that, is that correct? It's our digital retailing tool. Yeah. And we use it. Oh, that's uh, right. They don't do that. Yeah. yeah, and we use it. Um, we use it a lot on the showroom as well. So, you know, I know they get pitched as a digital retailing tool, but we use it, especially right now where we're not discounting cars. So the price that it is online is the price and the salesperson can sit down with the customer on the showroom floor and go, here you go. Here's what your payments are. Oh, I was hoping for a lower payment. Okay, let me click the button. There's a lease. Here's longer term. Here's and they can enter their credit app right there, pushes right into dealer track, submits it to the bank. I mean, it's it's a pretty slick, uh, pretty slick setup. So who do you use for digital menu? Uh, impact. Okay. Okay. For F and I, I think, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm just curious. Um, but I know Carrie wise, um, she's fantastic and she had a phenomenal presentation and I always appreciate auto five by the way, is because they have always, uh, sponsored my events and they sponsored those two F and I round tables and, um, in Baltimore and in Atlanta, and they always kick it off. They always kick off my workshops in round table. Awesome. So it was really cool. So I'm hoping my whole idea is to take this on the road and by the fall, I hope to be back to Atlanta, Georgia at the Alpharetta, at the Marriott and Alpharetta. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be amazing. And Josh, I'm going to do everything I can to pull you out of your all right. store <laughs> and have you uh, present to the group. Great. Because you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Always the best. Customer A visits your website and is interested in purchasing a vehicle. They fill out an interest form with a name and email and wait for your team to respond. Customer B visits your website and is interested in the same vehicle, only this customer has clicked the Get Pre-Qualified button on your inventory page. Within seconds you have access to a FICO score, open trade lines, and other useful credit and contact information. Which of these leads would you rather work? Quick Qualify is a softball solution offering a call to action lead form that can be integrated into digital retailing, dealership websites, email marketing, live chat, and in-store applications. 
Once completed, the form provides consumers their credit score for free while providing dealers detailed credit information on a warm lead. Using Quick Qualify on your dealership website enables consumers to get pre-qualified at the top of the sales funnel, improving both your sales cycle and the customer's buying experience. With a credit file in hand, your team can start their process more confidently and have closing conversations earlier in the sales cycle, helping you close deals faster. Drive more qualified leads. Gain visibility into credit worthiness before a customer even visits your dealership. Hold deal gross and sell more cars. If you're ready to get more actionable data regarding your consumers earlier in the sales process so you can close deals faster, then give 700 credit a call today.